I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. I'm glad to see these young people here today. I love you guys. Uh, if I can do anything for anybody today, I want to do it for these young people, is that I want to instill in them the fact that this Bible right here is the Word of God. It is the guidebook for your life. You're being taught these things in your school right now, um, sort of um, just, just by teaching them. But at some point in your life, you get it in your heart and you understand that God is your God and He's your Savior. Can I hear you say amen? I'm going to teach you a lot of things today, probably all the slides and graphics I don't have time to get through today, but uh, I'm just going to kind of lay a framework, framework for you so you can understand where I'm coming from and why I teach some of the things that I teach, why I believe some of the things that I believe, why, in fact, I have two books up here that I'm going to reference and I keep them separated here for a reason. This is my King James Bible over here. This is the one I like. And then right here... I have a copy of Morals and Dogma from Albert Pike. Now, I'm just going to set this aside. He, he talks a lot about symbols and numbers. So I'm going to teach you some numbers and I'm going to teach you some symbols, not from here yet, but I'm going to teach them to you from the Bible. Everybody look up at the screen here. Uh, Genesis chapter 7. We're going to talk about the number 7. Uh, in fact, here's what I want you to do. Who has your Bible? Anybody bring their Bible? Okay, good. Okay, that's good. Uh, we're not one of those churches yet. Amen? Okay. So anyway, I want you to take your Bible and see if you can find the 70th chapter of the Bible. And that's for these guys in this school here. I'll see how smart you are. All right. I would say turn to the seventh chapter of the Bible, but that's too easy. Okay. And then I want somebody to find the 490th chapter of the Bible. Uh, and then the 777th chapter. No, I won't. We'll talk about that in a minute. The number seven, God will give you the meaning of the numbers in the Bible. You won't have to look elsewhere. You just have to look inside the scriptures. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. There's some more numbers there. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So the number seven is a number for completion and a finished work in the Bible. Look at, here it is. Who found it before I put it up here? Way to go. Okay, Exodus chapter 20. There are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. You move 20 more. Now you're in the 70th chapter of the Bible. And this is interesting to me because 70, 7 times 10, 7 the number for perfection, 10 the number. Who can think of something in the Bible that has 10? 10 commandments. Ten commandments. Come on, guys. Okay, 10 commandments. Okay, so watch this. In Exodus chapter 20, this is where the 10 commandments are. Seven times ten, seventy. And God spake, and by the let's count these words up here. And God spake all these words, saying, How many words do I have up here? Seven. It's the number for perfection. And do you believe, when you read the Bible, do you believe that God spake all of those words? Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Uh, here are the seven spirits of God. Revelation chapter 4. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Uh, which are the seven spirits of God. Isaiah chapter 11 talks about those seven spirits in reference to the prophecy concerning Christ. It calls him the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord, that's one. The spirit of wisdom, that's two. Understanding, that's three. The spirit of counsel, that's four. And might, that's five. The spirit of knowledge, that's six. And the fear of the Lord, there are the seven spirits of God right there. Okay? So I want you to think about this because... In our presentation today, I'm going to show you opposites, okay? I'm going to show you opposites. This is the Word of God, okay? This is opposite of this, okay? So when we learn a teaching here, for instance, the number seven, when we see that the number seven references completion and perfection, but it also points you to the light that the Holy Spirit gives us as Christians um, and the seven spirits of God, when we see something that has to do with the number seven here, it is going to be the exact opposite of that. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? So I want you to think of Christ, 
who has the seven spirits of God in him. And then I want you to think of Revelation 13, a beast, and he has how many heads? He has seven heads, doesn't he? Okay? That's because the dragon has how many heads? Seven. Okay? And so those seven heads, since the dragon, the devil, and the beast are the opposite of Christ and the Holy Spirit, then we're talking about the opposite of the Spirit of the Lord. We're not talking with the beast of the Spirit of the Lord. We're talking about the Spirit of Antichrist that John talked about. We're talking about, instead of the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Foolishness. Instead of the Spirit of Understanding, the Spirit of Darkness. You see how that works so far? Okay? So when Albert Pike talks about the number seven and how sacred it is, we understand that it is, it is its opposite from the King James Bible. By the way, in the King James Bible, the phrase Holy Spirit is found exactly seven times in the Bible. The phrase Word of God, this exact phrase is mentioned 49 times in the Bible, which is seven times seven. So you know what I get out of that? That the Word of God is perfect and complete. Can I hear you say amen? Do we need to add anything to it? Should we add anything to it? Absolutely not. It's perfect. It's complete. How about this? Jesus' title of Son of God in various forms is mentioned 49 times in the New Testament. The Jesus, the Son of God, is the Word of God. The place where the Son of God was born, Bethlehem is mentioned 39 times. Bethlehem, Judah is mentioned 10 times. That's a total of 49 times. God's title of Most High is mentioned 49 times. And I want you to look at this because God is the Most High. Is there anybody higher than God? Absolutely not. But look what Lucifer said in Isaiah 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And seven words he says here. I will be like the most high. Why does he have seven heads? Why does the beast have seven heads? Think about it. The God's title of Holy One is mentioned 49 times in the King James Bible. The name Jesus. I like this. He's mentioned 980 times in your King James Bible. That is 70 times 7 times 2. Let's think about those numbers. Can you think of a verse in the Bible that talks about 70 times 7? Forgiveness. How often shall we forgive? Until 7 times? Jesus said no. Until 70 times 7. And watch this now. He, the number 2 is used because Christ is the forgiver of his brethren Israel. Say amen. Amen. And he came the first time to forgive their sins and they wouldn't have it. Is he coming again? And he's going to forgive their sins, isn't he? If you look in Daniel chapter 9, you'll see the 70 weeks and you'll count seven things that the Messiah is going to do for Israel in the last days. And he's going to make a completion of their sins. Somebody say amen. You have to love Israel, by the way. If you love Jesus, you have to love his family. Amen. Jesus' title of Son of Man is mentioned exactly 196 times, which is 49 times 4. Who can think of something in the Bible that's the number 4? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Where's the story of Jesus? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 49 times 4, Son of Man. The name Jesus Christ is mentioned exactly 196 times, 49 times 4. The phrase, THE WORD, with a capital W in your King James, is mentioned seven times. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here's another pattern. I want you to count things. I want you to count rhythms in the Bible. How many times in John chapter 1 is the word, Word, mentioned up here? Three. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Unless you have an NIV... And it doesn't have that verse in the NIV or the Message Bible. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Listen to this. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. God said that three times. Why? Because we believe Father, Word, and Holy Ghost were all there creating the earth. you believe that, say amen. Poor Eric Von Doniken, who believes the space aliens were the ones who seeded this planet. He's wrong. Amen? Okay? Uh, let's see here. The gospel of God is mentioned seven times. The phrase works of God seven times. Power of God seven times. Mount or mountain of God seven times. And the cross 
is mentioned 28 times, which is what? Seven times what? Four. How many Gospels? You get it? Um, in the generations of Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, you move all the way down. There are 14 and 14 and 14. The total is 42, 7 times 6. What day was man created? Sixth day. Who is God? He's the number 7. It's the multiple of the two. 7 times 6. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Do you believe that? Sure he was. Okay. Um, the generations of Luke chapter 3 equals 77. Um, you, go, you count the generations in Luke 3. The word church is mentioned exactly 77 times in the King James Bible. Why? Because we are joint heirs with Jesus. We have been adopted in. We are now the brothers of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Okay. And what he inherits, we inherit because we are joint heirs with him. That's why you will find 77 in the lineage of Christ and the church mentioned 77 times. The word Passover is mentioned 77 times in the King James Bible. All forms of the word baptize are found 77 times. Now that is really important. I want you to get that number. Because the number 77 will point you to the birth of Christ. Starting from, starting from Adam, you count down. There's 77 names in that lineage. The church and baptism, which is our new birth. So I want you to understand that because later on we're going to see the number 77. Uh, the phrase the end of the world mentioned seven times. Into the earth mentioned 28 times in the Bible. Seven years is found 42 times. Seven times is found 35 times. If you add them together you get 77. The phrase seven days is mentioned exactly 98 times in the King James Bible. All occurrences of the seventh day and seventh month are found 77 times in the Old Testament. Even the word Sabbath is mentioned 77 times in the Old Testament. And who knows what the word Sabbath means? Seven. Finished. Complete. It's over with. God had six days and then he had the seventh day of rest. I believe you ought to rest. Amen. Okay? Jesus. Now watch this. Now this is where it's going to get good. Jesus Christ is mentioned 196 times. Son of Man 196 times. We're seeing a pattern here. 49 times 4. In Revelation chapter 5, John said, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a what? <clears throat> it wasn't a copy of this, was it? God's not reading Albert Pike's Morals and Doctrine saying, Oh, that's who I am. Okay? What did he have in his hand? A book sealed with seven seals okay there's the book of God by the way where is Jesus right now at the right hand of God see they're the same aren't they okay David said in thy right hand are pleasures forevermore amen that's better than having one of these in your right hand amen The Ten Commandments, watch this, as Moses turned and went down from the mount, the two tables of the testimony were where? In his hand. How many tables do we have in this book here? Two, Old Testament, New Testament. Watch this now. Uh, the tables were written on both their sides, the one on the side and the every, and were, on the other were they written. That's the same, that's a picture of the book that God has in his right hand. And by the way, they're written on both sides and they're written in stone. Why? So you can't add to. God's pretty serious about it, isn't he? Okay. The word book is found 196 times in the King James Bible. The book is Christ. He is the book. Amen. Did Jesus ever sin? Did he ever make a mistake? Then there are no mistakes in the book. Amen. I'll get you guys going. I'm better than coffee when I get going in this stuff. Amen. Here's the first Old Testament occurrence of the word book. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Okay? Now, that's the first. Now, notice that it's the book of the generations, plural, because we see a pattern in Genesis chapter 5 of death. Okay? You study it and you'll see it. Adam lived. Do you believe that Adam lived 930 years or was that a mistake? He lived 930 years, didn't he? Okay? Now, I want you to remember that. The first New Testament occurrence of the word book. 
the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Watch this, because here we have Adam, the first Adam, and Jesus is the second Adam. The first Adam brings death, the second Adam brings, isn't that beautiful? Somebody say, so the Old Testament brings death. That's why Israel is dead right now. One of these days their eyes are going to be open. And they're going to read the New Testament. And they're going to see they're, the veil of Moses is going to be lifted. And when the veil of Moses is lifted, who are they going to see under that veil? Jesus Christ. Somebody say, oh man. That's the first New Testament occurrence of the word book. Guess what the 930th chapter is? Matthew chapter 1. You see, I believe that this Bible was written by God, breathed by God, preserved by God, set up by God. Amen? That's what I believe. Uh, the book of the, there are 42 names in this lineage. The word book is mentioned 42 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. 490th chapter of the Bible. Who found that one? I don't think so. The words of the Lord are present tense. Not were. Not didn't used to be. They are right now pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth purified how many times? Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Do you have a preserved Bible? Okay. Has to be. God said it has to be. The 777th chapter of the Bible is Jeremiah 32. I'm going to teach you a little story of Jeremiah chapter 32. God is dealing with Judah. They're about ready to go into Babylonian captivity. God has had it. You know, God has a line. Don't cross it. Okay. America's going to cross God's line, aren't they? Okay? They're going to, and God's going to say, I've had enough. Judah had crossed God's line. She had followed after her sister, the other ten tribes. She had followed her in her idolatry and her iniquity. And God was going to judge them. And he was going to send them into captivity. For how long? It's perfect, isn't it? Okay? It's a picture of the last days. How many times does the priest sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant on the Day of Atonement? That's because when Jesus does it for real, it is finished. Amen? You do not add to the finished, complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen. You don't do it. You don't do it by works. You don't do it by giving. You don't do it by anything. I want you to remember that. In Jeremiah 32, God told Jeremiah to go buy a piece of property that belonged to his uncle. He had the right to possess it. He had the right to buy it. And so he went and bought this property, Jeremiah chapter 32. Why did God want Jeremiah to do this? He took and bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17, there's a number there, shekels of silver, and I subscribed the evidence and sealed it. There's a book in God's right hand. That's how? Sealed. Okay? And I sealed it and, uh, and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances, so I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. So he has two copies, right? And one's open, and one's sealed. I you to get this. Revelation is the 27th book of the, of, the, of the New Testament. It's open. It's revealed, isn't it? Daniel is the 27th book of the Old Testament. It's sealed, isn't it? God said, seal up the vision, didn't he? So we have in this Bible one book that's open and one book that's... And when's it going to be unsealed? Revelation... Not today. <laughs> I am not Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Revelation chapter 5 and 6. Because there is only one who is worthy. Amen? There's only one who is worthy. So watch this. So he took it. And uh, he subscribed the book, the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed in this, in this land. You know what I believe in? I believe in a God of hope. 
I believe that when your life is a wreck and you're in captivity, I believe that God's going to bring you out of it. Somebody say amen. And God wanted it. God wanted, God wanted written. Watch this now. God wanted written evidence. Written evidence that they were going to come back into that land again. That's why he said go buy this property and seal it up. And, and, and watch this now. Where did God tell Jeremiah to take the records that were sealed and open? What did he tell him to do? Put them, where did he tell him to put them? He said, put them in an earthen vessel. We have this treasure where? In us. Amen. God is preserving the word and the evidence that Israel is going to be saved in the last days. He's preserving that in anybody who will stand and say, I believe in the word of God. And anybody who will say, you know what, who owns a title deed to property? You own, you own a title to property? Could I go to your lockbox and pull that out and rewrite that for you? Why not? It's against the law and you don't trust, I wouldn't trust me. Why would I want to rewrite your law? Why would I want to rewrite your title? Because I own property next to you and you've got a well that I want. Okay? So we don't change the Bible. God put that treasure in earthen vessels. Young people, you are the earthen vessel that God wants to instill His Word in because these guys, we're all going to die off one of these days. And God wants a generation who will stand when everybody else has died off who have preserved the Word of God in their hearts. Amen? That's what God wants out of you guys. Watch this. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after that you believed you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Seven spirits, seven seals um, of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until what? The redemption of the purchased possession. One of these days, Christ is going to start unsealing the book. And he's going to show the world... This land does not belong to the Palestinian Authority, nor the United Nations, nor the Vatican. It belongs to my people. And I'm going to give it back to them. Let me hear you say amen. Oh, yeah. What is that? Who likes to look at stars? Where am I young? You like to look at stars? You got a, you got a telescope? I, I never had to tell, I always had binoculars, okay? And I love to look at stars. I like to look, I just, I just love that. God created those, amen? And it's stupid to me why anybody would go, I wonder what they're telling me about my future. When you could look here to the one who made this, that made that, and find out really what God holds in your future. Um, I want you to take your fingers Everybody do this, okay? And make like the smallest amount of light that you can possibly get right between your fingers, okay? And I want you to hold it up to the sky. Well, Chris, you ought to be getting a shot of this on everybody, all right? And if you go out at night and hold that up to the sky where just barely enough light is allowed to pass through your fingers, that's what you'll see. Well, you won't see it, but that's what's out there. Hubble Space Telescope <clears throat> goes and takes a picture of places that we never even knew it existed. 14 billion light years. And, and they say, that, you know, the whole universe is 15 billion light years. So in 1 billion years, all this formed. It didn't happen that way, did it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here, these are clusters of galaxies. Who knows what a galaxy is? What's a galaxy? Anybody know? It's a cluster of stars. And there's billions of them in, in one galaxy. Billions of stars in one galaxy. What galaxy are we in? What do they call it? I thought it was a Snickers. But, okay, it's the Milky Way, right? Okay, the Milky Way galaxy. And there's billions of stars in, in our galaxy. Okay? So here, in this one picture... There are so many galaxies in this one little area that we can't even count them, much less the number of stars in there. And then you multiply that by the whole sky. And that's how many there are there. Who can count that high? I know a God that, I know a God that named every one of them. Amen. What is that word? 
One verse. One verse. What is that verse? For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. You see, God spake all of that into existence. It didn't bang. He spoke it. And God said, look at the method of creation. Look how God chose to create. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The method that God uses to create is His Word. Would you like to be a new creation in Christ? You cannot be unless God speaks it. Amen? Our job as preachers is to not to give our philosophy, our vain philosophy, and the words of the wisdom of men. Our job as preachers is to give the unalterable, incorruptible word of God to people so that, as David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What's this? Who's, who's, my, who's my math geniuses here, back here? Who's my math geniuses? Come on, everybody's pointing to you. You're it. You're the guy. Okay? Let's look at a pattern. Okay? 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, on, on and on and on. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 2 plus 3, 5 plus 8. Okay, you see there's a pattern here. Okay? Each number is the sum of the two previous numbers in the pattern. It's called the Fibonacci sequence, the golden ratio, the golden mean. It's roughly 1.618 is what it works out to be, okay? And I was not a mathematician. You wouldn't believe how hard it took me to get this, okay? Because, I mean, I just don't think that way. But God showed me this. So watch this. If you take the Fibonacci pattern and you turn them into squares, here's two squares here that add up to two. Let's say that's one inch. One inch and one inch is two inches. Two, one and two is three inches and then 5 and 8 and 13, you get a spiral is what you get. Now watch this and then take a look at this. How many of you see the same spiral there? Gets bigger as you go. That is called God's ratio. You will see it in just about every aspect of creation. Okay? It's like God is the artist and he signed his name across the bottom to show you that it's legitimate. Okay? So here we go. Now let's look at this. Um, let's see here. You see it in the flower arrangement here? You see the spiral. Has the same pattern to it. Broccoli. Who likes broccoli? <laughs> same spiral pattern. You see it here in this grass? If you take grass, you know, let the grass grow a little bit, and you take, you cut the grass off, what are you going to see down in there when you look down? Grass grows up in a spiral, doesn't it? Same Fibonacci sequence. How about that? Same sequence. How about that? Same sequence. Same sequence. Even water. Even water has the same pattern to it. When you see waves coming in, okay, you guys live close to the ocean or closer than I do, okay, you can go to the ocean and you can watch those waves and as they curl over because of the moon's gravitational pull, as they curl over, they will curl over in a Fibonacci sequence. How in the world did something inanimate like water that does not grow, it is not alive, and yet it follows the exact same pattern? Who created water? Who created the fish in that water? God did, and they all have his signature. You can even flush your toilet and fight. you go, go home and go, look, Mom. Okay? Water is a symbol of life in the Bible. We cannot live without water. Amen? Jesus washes the church with what? This is the water right here. You need to clean yourself up every day when you're out in the nasty world. Amen? If you go home and watch Jerry Springer, you need to read your Bible afterward and clean up. Amen? That which was from the beginning that we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have handled, looked upon, and our hands have handled of what? I'm going to teach you something right here. 
You have, do you believe that you have the Word of God in your hand right now? See, this book is, is touchable, readable, audible, seeable. We can read it, touch it, feel it, hug it if we want to. I've had to a few times. Masons believe in a lost word. A word that guides the doctrines and the ideologies of Freemasonry that is lost, hidden, cannot be seen, cannot be heard, and cannot be touched. We're dealing with opposites, aren't we? This book is alive. Masonry teaches that the lost word is dead. What religion do you want to follow? What philosophy of life do you want to live by? A word that is alive and quick and powerful or one that is dead and buried? You see where I'm going here? Okay? The word of life. This word gives life. What is this? Well, I don't know if it came from the Dead Sea, but I know it's a scroll. So I want you to imagine you're a Jewish rabbi and you're reading from the Old Testament. You're reading from the book of Isaiah, like Jesus did, right? He reads from the book of Isaiah. Why? It has 66 chapters. How many books are in your Bible? So he stands in the, in the synagogue and he, he opens the book. Isn't it beautiful? He's acting out his second coming, folks. And he rolls it back up. And as he rolls the book, you look in the ends and you see a Fibonacci spiral. It's the Word of God. Isn't it beautiful? Okay? So watch this. Here we go. What is this? It's an umbilical cord. It gives life from the mother to the child. Heaven is our mother. New Jerusalem. Galatians 4, go read it. Heaven is our mother. Our lifeline to heaven is this. Amen? Sever the cord and you sever the life. That's why you have dark days when you don't read your Bible. Amen? Same Fibonacci spiral. Okay? God wants to show us something. Let's go back to stars here. Most galaxies are in this exact same form. How did that happen? If it all just blew out randomly, how is it that all this random activity formalized itself in such a unique, controlled way? How is it that most galaxies in the universe look exactly like that? It's because they were spoken by the incorruptible Word of God. I could look at galaxies all day. I love them. To the chief musician of Psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God. That means, by the way, in the Bible, stars are what? Angels. When Lucifer takes his tail and drags one-third of the stars, what is he doing? He's taking one-third of the heavenly host down with him, isn't he? You should think about that. We're going to talk about it later, okay? So watch this. Stars are angels. And so the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his what? I'm going to show you something about the hand here in a little bit. Day unto day utter a speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I, it took me years until God showed me one day what this meant. I believe the stars proclaim the glory of God. I believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, don't you? The stars utter the glory of God. Let's think about this. Who is the glory of God? Jesus is. Jesus is the glory of God. Was there a star present at his first coming? And what happened? Who did the shepherds hear from? Billy Graham? <laughs> Benny Hinn? Who did the shepherds hear from? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And right now, there is not a place in the world that has not at least heard of the Christmas story of the birth of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. God's word's real, isn't it? It was declared by angels. I love it. 
Watch this. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heaven shall be what? That's what that is. They're rolled together as a scroll. Fibonacci sequence. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. So here we have the, even the angels follow the same pattern. Who plays the piano? Anybody? Okay. Zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, and 13. How many white keys are here? There's eight. How many black keys? Five. And they're divided between three and two. Add them all together in an octave, you have 13. Even music follows. The, that's why there we have the book of Psalms in the Bible. That's why God blesses good, decent singing. Amen. And he don't bless rap. Come on. What's that? Y'all know about those, don't you? Had your experience with those? Same pattern. Same Fibonacci sequence. Do you know why? Because God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. When God speaks, it follows the same exact pattern. By the way, how are we going up? How did, did Elijah go up into heaven? I love it. What is that? That is your inner ear, your cochlea. It has the same exact pattern. That's what it looks like. See the spiral? How about that? He who has to hear, let him hear. So we put them together. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Beautiful. What's that? It's a ram's horn. What significant does it play in the scriptures? And that shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the what? The ram's horn and we shall hear the sound of the trumpet. I like this. All the people shall shout with a great shout. What are we waiting to hear, people? The Lord shall come from heaven with a shout and the, at the last trump. Amen. Okay? Typology here. And the people shall shout with a great shout in the wall of the city. What city? And how many times did they compass Jericho? Tell it right. Thirteen. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. That's thirteen. We're going to find out why. Okay? We're going to find out why. Man, make the two trumpets of what? The word of the Lord are pure words as what? Silver tried in the furnace of earth. And so we have two trumpets of silver. Old Testament and New Testament. You already go read the law on this because if only one sounded, that meant one thing. But if both of them sounded, that meant something completely up. You go look at that. The, the trumpets is a picture of the word of God. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a what? And whose voice did he hear? Jesus! His, hey, when it says, as watchmen on the wall of Israel, Ezekiel 33, when we're to sound a trumpet, you know what that means? Preach the King James Bible. You know why the King James? Because Paul said, if a trumpet make an uncertain sound, there's confusion. Wow. Let me talk about DNA for a minute. An angstrom is a very, very little bitty tiny unit of measurement. Okay? Scientists know that DNA is 21 angstroms wide, 34 angstroms tall. That means from the bottom of one spiral to the top of that spiral, it's 21 angstroms across the base and 34 angstroms tall. Those two numbers are Fibonacci numbers. So our DNA has the exact same spiral as all these other things that we have seen in this presentation so far. What is this? No, it's a picture of the temple. It's not the real one. Okay? I'm going to show you what the real one is here in a minute. This is a picture of the temple. What? Know ye not that your... So this is what? The temple of God. Do you believe that? Say amen. Because God doesn't dwell where? In temples made with hands. He doesn't dwell in here. He dwells in here. 
Amen? So it's wrong, isn't it, Tanya, for a church to say you can only receive eternal life in our church. That's wrong, isn't it? Because God doesn't dwell there. Okay? Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. To in them, the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. The sun is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The heavens are the tabernacle that the sun rises and sets in. Okay? Here it is, the temple again. Now watch this. He also has lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The word temples is mentioned exactly 208 times in the King James Bible and there are exactly 208 bones in your body. Our bones are the framework of the temple that God has created which matches this book perfectly. So if you lose an arm, you're not really all there, are you? How many of you know somebody that's not all there? <laughs> you're, look, you're looking at one, all right? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? So I want you to think about a symbol that you'll find of bones in a skull. Well, we're getting there, aren't we? What's that? And men don't have one less rib than women. Okay? Who knows how many ribs we have? 24. 12 on one side, 12 on the other. It is our breastplate of righteousness. Okay? We have two lungs here. Why? Air, breath, pneuma, spirit. How many books, how many sections do we have in the Bible? Old Testament, New Testament. How many spirits of God do we have? Seven spirits. There are seven vascular bundles called nodes in our lungs that exchange oxygen inside of our blood to make our body live. Oh, isn't that beautiful? All right. And what do we have there underneath the lungs? A heart. How many chambers? Four chambers. Why? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Christ, doesn't, since he doesn't dwell in churches made with hands, he dwells in our temple. And our heart is a picture of the dwelling place of God, the throne of God, the mercy seat of God, where the word is, thy word have I hidden where? In thy heart. Moses took a copy of the word and put it in the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was carried by how many Levite priests? Four. Why? Because the real Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, Ezekiel chapter 1, was born about by four living creatures. We are the perfect image of God. There's our heart. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. John saw the throne of God and he saw the four and twenty elders sitting around the throne clothed in white raiment. That is, here's the twenty-four elders right here surrounding your, the throne of God inside your... Who believes now that the Bible is the Word of God and that you were made in the image of God and this Bible? Somebody say amen. amen. <clears throat> what is this? No, it's an x-ray of a hand. Come on. And um, we have bones in our hand. Remember, bones are important. And I want you to look at the top two bones of, the, of your index finger. Everybody do this, okay? Because God's what number? Amen? Okay. And yet he's three, isn't he? Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. And these three are... What did God write the Ten Commandments with? Yeah. So look at the top there. If I take the first two bones of your index finger and I bring them down to the third bone of your index finger, they're exactly the same length. That's the Fibonacci sequence. Remember, one, this, this plus this equals this. And if I bring the second bone and the third bone down to in, inside your hand, this long bone here, I get the exact same length. God has a pattern, the Fibonacci pattern, inside the hands, uh, inside your hands or inside the fingers of your hand. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with what? We said it a while ago. The finger of God. And so here, everything, what we're seeing is that everything that we see that has this Fibonacci pattern is related to the Word of God somehow, some way. So it's written with the finger of God. There are 27 bones in your hand and there are 27 books in the New Testament. Somebody say amen. 
Because, watch this now, because look at the hand and how it's used in the scripture. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Christ is the New Testament. Remember, he said, this is the New Testament of my blood. Christ is the New Testament, and he is the right hand of God, and Christ has dashed in pieces the enemies of God. Somebody say amen. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest. How? By the right, you're not saved unless you have the, unless it's by the right hand of God. Um, let's see here. Now know that I, the Lord, saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand, that thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand and hear me. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. You get blessed when you read the right hand of God. Amen. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which is his right hand, which his right hand had purchased. And the Lord said unto me, oh, I love this. I love this. The Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. I want you to watch this. This is Moses. And Moses is saying, God, I, I know you're sending me to my people, but what is the sign that how are they going to believe me? Because remember, Moses was hard of speech, wasn't he? That's a picture of the Old Testament, which when the Jews read, they don't understand. Because every Jew, when they read the Old Testament, the veil is still there. Amen? And so Paul said that Moses had a speech impediment, and he was hard to talk, and so that's why they can't understand the Old Testament. Paul said, I, I use plainness of speech in the New Testament. So watch this. Here's the hand, and it's a picture of Jesus Christ, because that's where Christ is. He is the right hand of God. So watch this. The book of John says that Jesus, before he came to the earth, was where? He was in the bosom of his Father. Isn't that beautiful? And Jesus comes to the earth the first time. That's Moses taking the hand out of the bosom. And when he looks at it the first time, it's leprous as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. You don't see snow much a lot, so you don't get it. Okay? Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Why did Jesus look like leprosy? Because the Bible says he, he was made sin for us who knew no sin. He became our sin on the cross. Amen? So watch this. And Moses looks at his hand and it's got leprosy. And he said, now Moses, put it back in your bosom. Because when Jesus finished the work, where did he go? As the faithful high priest, he goes back to the presence of the Father to offer the atonement of the sins of mankind. And Moses, God said, Moses, take it out again. And now it's clean. Why? Because when Jesus comes the second time, he comes without sin. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. I want you everybody to do this with your hand. Here you have your four fingers. What do we say the four was for? The gospel of Jesus Christ. How many walls does New Jerusalem have? Four walls. And there are, watch this now, there are three gates on each wall. And God graved them in the palms of your hands. You know what God's saying to Israel? How could I ever forget you? Because I've graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are ever before me. Somebody say amen. And, and, and since we're speaking of opposites, here's the Bible. Here's the uh, Masonic uh, morals and dogma. There is a total opposite to this teaching here in the world. It's called palmistry. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Uh, let's see here. This is your spine. Some of you have one. Some of you don't. Okay. 33 bones in your vertebrae, Exodus 33, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. God was showing he, Moses his spine. 33 bones. How old was Jesus? Who was he seeing? He was seeing a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the spine is, holds together the framework of the temple, doesn't it? Jesus holds it all together, doesn't he? By him were all things made, and by him all things consist or are held together this is your skull okay uh there are 22 bones in this skull uh and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the what skull which is called in the hebrew golgotha now get this the number 22 is the number for revelation 
So the skull is the revealing of the atonement of Israel. At the place of the skull, it was finally revealed. In Genesis chapter 22 is the story where God said, Take thine only son and offer him up there on the mountain that I will show you. The mountain was Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. And it was revealed through Genesis 22, the place of the skull, 22 bones, that Jesus is the atonement of mankind. Somebody say amen. I love it. All right. Now let's talk about deoxyribonucleic acid for a minute. Why not? Okay. Let's talk about something that's way big over our head that we don't understand. Let's make it real simple. Okay. Here you have the DNA strand. We're used to seeing that on the news. We see it everywhere. Company logos now are, talk, are using DNA as their logo, aren't they? There's a reason why. <clears throat> Remember symbolism. The Bible uses symbolism, but it uses word pictures, and then it explains the symbolism. Mark chapter 4, the parable of the seed and the sower. We know what the seed is, don't we? And we know what the sower is, and we know all those things because we believe the Bible. The world, and Albert Pike uses symbols that they don't give you the meaning of. Okay? But we're going to find them out later in this talk. Uh, your DNA is found in things called chromosomes. Your DNA consists of two ba or four base pairs hooked together. We'll look at that here in a little bit. And you have 23 pairs of chromosomes in every cell of your body. Um, here we have DNA. It has a sugar phosphate backbone. That's what holds it together. That's the part of DNA that holds it together. It's made of phosphate and sugar because... Uh, let's see here. Where's the verse here? I'm missing the verse. The Bible says the entrance of thy words giveth light. Phosphate is called a phosphate because it's made of phosphorus and it's light. It glows. Sugar. Uh, they're, you're, they're held together by guanine and cytosine and adenine and thiamine. And when these things work together, these bases code for an amino acid. You have exactly 22 amino acids that make your genes. Let me explain this. Who, who, who's our guys in here that have hair and who's our guys that don't? <clears throat> okay? If you have a lot of hair, that's because your base pairs form together to form amino acids which group together to make genes that determine whether you were going to lose your hair at 40 or keep it until you were 80. That's your genetic structure. It was determined from birth whether or not you were going to have a lot of hair or very little hair or red hair, or black hair, or lots of gray hair. Amen? Okay? It was determined at birth, these things. You didn't, you didn't when you hit five years old, say, I want to lose all my hair. Okay? It was determined for you at birth. That's because of your genetic structure. We look the way we look. We talk the way we talk. We stand the way we stand. Because our genes are being formed inside of our DNA. It's like, it's like a book. And I'll show you that in a minute. So if you were to look at these, these genes as they're being coded together, they would look like they're up in the upper right hand of the screen. The interesting thing is, is that, you know, you hear these stories on the news where, you know, scientists are able to discover the gene that causes cancer, pancreatic cancer and so on. So have you ever heard stories like that? The reason why they were able to figure that out is because they found out that inside the genetic sequencing, the coding of your DNA, They'll have a sequence of genes and then it'll stop. And there is an area of DNA that's called stop DNA. So you'll have a gene sequence and it'll stop. You'll have another gene sequence and it'll stop. And then you'll have another one. You know what that is? God built into the book that he wrote of your DNA sentences and periods and paragraphs. Just like in a book. God wrote it that way. Somebody say amen. Okay? So watch this. Here we go. Uh, why do I have Psalm 119 up here? It has 22. If you open your, your Bible and open up Psalm 22, you'll see Aleph, eight verses. Beth, eight verses. Uh, what is it? Gimel? Gimel, eight verses. Daleth, eight verses. It's sequenced out in 22 sections. That's because Hebrew has 22 letters. And you have 22 amino acids or 22 letters that your book of DNA is written in. And scientists say that it formed by chance over billions and billions of years. So imagine you taking a typewriter, three million sheets of paper, going out into a field, throwing it all out there and say, write a book. 
What would happen, what would you go back and find one year later? What would you go back in that field and find one year later? It's the law of entropy. Things don't get better. So evolution's impossible, isn't it? And yet they want you to believe that DNA wrote itself. It did not. It could not have. So here we have DNA written just like a book. It's scrolled up just like a scroll. And everything that God chooses to speak through, music, DNA, the ram's horn, the ear, the whirlwind, the stars, even the hand, they all follow the same Fibonacci pattern. David said 3,000 years ago, Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Let me illustrate this for you. In thy book, DNA, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Somebody say amen. From the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, you were the creation of God. That's why abortion's wrong. It's murder, isn't it? Okay? John the Baptist wasn't full of the Holy Ghost from birth. He was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Amen? Okay? You are the unique creation of God. And it just amazes me when you see this verse for what it is. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuous was fashioned, yet when as yet there was none of them. We can't even see DNA, and yet David was describing things that he had never seen. How? Seven spirits of God. Okay? So this and our DNA are the same. The entrance of thy words giveth light. We talked about the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. Here we have the four base pairs. Watch this now, fix and get happy. All right? I didn't come here to be mad and angry and sad. Amen. Come here to get happy. Okay? We have four base pairs that link DNA together. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. There's going to be a test afterwards. Okay? Adenine, guanine, cytosine. I didn't know all this stuff until I started looking at it. Four base pairs. You know what the neat thing is? In fact, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but I want you to watch this because I'm going to show you something neat. This is on my neat list here. Adenine always links with thymine, and guanine always links with cytosine. They always work together. So watch this. I'm going to show you how this works in DNA. In your cell, you have in, the, in your cell nucleus a copy of your DNA. Okay? They're contained in your chromosomes, 23 pairs, 46 in total. You know that your cells divide. That's how you grow. Okay? So your cells divide, and when it's time for the new cell to form, there has to be a copy of this DNA going to the new cell. So you know what happens? The DNA that's twisted like this is opened up. Okay? And then it's rightly divided. It's unzipped right down the middle. So one half of your DNA stays in the old cell and the other half of your DNA goes into the new cell. Now, it's not complete because it's only half, right? And it won't live if it's only half. So you know what happens? The cell then is able to replicate the, the new strand of DNA, the other side of it, because if it's adenine here, then it must be thymine here. And if it's guanine here, it must be cytosine here. There's laws. Amen? There are laws. And so the Bible says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord, and read, None of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. They'll all hold together. Now watch this. Here we have, this is, a, this is a picture of how you read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament. Does the Old Testament agree with the New? Say yes. Because if you say no, I'll go after you, all right? Does the New Testament agree with the Old Testament? Because none shall want her mate. Isaiah said, precept upon precept, line upon line, here little and there little. They all join together. And what joins the Old Testament with the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. How many of you believe the Bible is the Word of God? How many believe that your DNA is the Word of God? If it's a book, if DNA is a book... Who wrote it? God. Who wants to rewrite it? 
Why? Okay, you think about this. Uh, thymine's different in its structure and its makeup. I won't get into all that, but that's the same pattern. You have the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's adenine, guanine, and cytosine. And John is different than the other three. Okay, so you have that pattern there. You remember Leah, Billa, Zilla, and Rachel? Who's different out of those four? She was the first love, wasn't she? And that's where the seed of Jesus came from. Wow. Okay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and who? One of them's different. Amen. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. And when they were coming to a place, you'll find Golgotha mentioned three times in the Gospels, and yet Calvary one time. Wow. Say it backwards. Wow. It's a ladder, isn't it? Can you think of a story in the Bible? And what did Jacob see on that ladder? He saw this angel of God ascending and descending on it. Light. The phosphate rungs of our ladder made of phosphate, made of light. And that's what angels are. They're ministers of light. And he dreamed a dream of a ladder. And the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Guess who that ladder is? It's Jesus. You shall see the angel of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus, folks, is the ladder that bridges earth and heaven together. Amen? So Pike talks about a symbol called the Masonic Ladder. And it's reaching from earth to heaven. It's joining earth and heaven. What or oh, what could he be talking about? Are we learning some symbols here? Okay. In the temple, Solomon built a set of winding stairs. Okay. In order to get to the sound booth of this church, you have to climb winding stairs. Okay. Those winding stairs were a picture of your DNA. It's a winding staircase. One e e helical turn in DNA from the bottom here to the top here, you'll have 10 stairs or rungs. The word stairs is used exactly 10 times in the Bible. In thy book all thy members were written, which in continuous fashion when as yet there was none of them. The first occurrence of the word book, we saw that a while ago, the generations of Adam. Then Jeremiah called Barak the son of uh, Neriah, and the Barak wrote the, from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him, and upon a roll of a book, the roll of a book. Um, let me skip over some of this here. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, whose names are written where? In the book of life. This is the book of life in our DNA is the book of life. There is not anything alive that does not have deoxyribonucleic acid. There's not anything alive that does not have a book written by God in them. Amen? And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth. How? It's because it's made out of sugar. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne of books written within on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Remember we saw that, the, uh, the, uh, the Moses and the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is a picture of your DNA because of the ten, the ten rungs and the, and the ten laws that are in the Ten Commandments. And he declared unto you his covenant which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments and he wrote them upon what? Two tables of stone. You have one rung and you have two rungs. They are the tables of stone. And DNA is a crystal. It's a stone. God made it that way. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. You have the, you have the Ten Commandments written into your DNA, don't you? Did, did you have to read the Bible to know that it was wrong to steal? Did you have to read the Bible to know it was wrong to commit murder? Did you have to read the Bible to know it was wrong to commit adultery? It's written in, the law is written in our hearts, isn't it? Romans said so that they're without excuse. Everybody knows they're a sinner. Amen? Everybody knows they're a sinner. Why? Because God wrote the Ten Commandments in their heart. Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by what? So what happens in DNA... When the cell is going to reproduce the DNA strand into the new cell, what happens in the new cell when the DNA is not encoded right? 
deformities, cancer, death. So what happens when we go out and make disciples? Our churches try to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And they don't give them the word. What's it going to bring to them? Death. Okay? Now the parable is this. The seed is what? Who near has children? You passed your seed down to your children. Okay? So the word of God was passed down to them in your DNA. But the word of God grew and what? Multiplied. What happens at the moment of conception? That child who is one cell automatically divides in two and then four and then eight and then 16 and 32, 64 and it gets bigger and then it starts growing arms and the heart starts beating. Amen. And it forms eyes and lips and a face and bones and it's born and it forms an attitude. Amen. Because you formed one when you were that age. Amen. Okay. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, and the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Remember we saw a Fibonacci picture of grass a while ago. How's it rolled up? Fibonacci scroll. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is what? Wow. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall... Did you know we have Adam's DNA in us? Who in here does not have Adam's DNA? Raise your hand. You are not of this world. Because all flesh is grass and grass withers and fades away, doesn't it? But the DNA sequence from Adam has continued all the way down until this very day. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, my goodness. I remember it's found in chromosomes, 23 pairs of 46 of them. Here's the two pillars that Solomon erected in the temple. They're called Jachin and Boaz. They are exactly 23 cubits tall apiece. That makes how many cubits? 46. That's how many chromosomes where your DNA is stored. Masons teach that the secrets of Freemasonry are hidden inside Jachin and Boaz. What do they mean? Okay. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. 46 words exactly. Because you know what happens when the man cleaves to the woman. They don't just become one flesh in spirit. They become one flesh nine months later. They pass down their DNA to their child. Know ye not that ye are the what? 46th book of the Bible is where that's found. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of what? The temple of his body. Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. The Greek alphabet has 24 letters. Add that up. 46 is the number of chromosomes you have where your DNA is stored. Hmm. And when he looked, behold, he's, his hand set on him, said unto me, and said, Look, a roll of a book. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with the roll that I give thee. Then did I eat, and it was in my mouth honey for sweetness. The word rolls is mentioned 23 times in the King James Bible. Even the ark of the testimony, and thou shalt put it into the ark of the testimony, which I shall... What, did, what was he talking about? He said, Moses, take the book and put it in the ark of the testimony. So you have the word being put in the ark. The word ark is mentioned exactly 230 times in the Bible. Mm -mm -mm. So watch this. The word was put in the ark. Okay? The DNA was put, the word was put in the ark. And the ark was put in the most holy place of the tabernacle. Does everybody understand that so far? This is every cell in your body. Here's the cell wall, there's the cell nucleus, the most holy place where the DNA is stored. Isn't that beautiful? So when the Bible says that you are the temple of God, every cell in your body declares that you are the temple of God. Amen? 
23,000 Levite priests performed the daily sacrifice in this human cell, or excuse me, in the tabernacle. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The word sacrifice is used in 23 verses of the New Testament. Here's the 23rd book of the Bible. It's the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. 46 things that declare Jesus, that prophesy of Jesus on the cross and his sufferings on the cross. I want you to get this because we're going we're gonna to show you something. See this? This is an X chromosome. It is where your DNA is stored. Okay? This is that. You have a cross, 46 of them. You know what? If you study the number 23 in the Bible, you know what you'll find? It's the number for death and sacrifice. Does anybody know what's in the 23rd chapter of the Bible? You're going to look it up, aren't you? It's the death of Sarah. Okay? 23rd book of the New Testament is where Jesus is talking about the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, and he said their mouth is as an open what? Wow. Death and sacrifice. I'll throw something in here that's not on the slides. The phrase, the devil, I like this. The phrase, the devil, is found exactly 46 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. And, the, and that's 23 times 2, right? 23 is the number for death, so we're dealing with the second death. The 46th time the phrase, the devil, is found, it says, the devil was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Aren't you glad he's going there and you're not? Mm-mm-mm. You have the cross. That's why you're to present your body a living sacrifice. And as Moses lifted up the what? I want you to get this. Because... It looks like two coiled... Have you ever seen that logo? Two coiled serpents together. And you go, you know what? That looks like DNA. Okay? That's what it is. Watch this now. Do you know how many words the devil spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden in your King James Bible? Guess how many? 46. Okay? The body that we inhabit right now is corrupt. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Mine is... And so is yours. That's why flesh and blood cannot do what? Inherit the kingdom of God. Because right now, not only is our DNA, well, not, is it not only crook, is sealed, but it's crooked. Just like serpents. And we've got that in us. Aren't we all? For all have sinned. And what verse is that? Romans 3 what? Okay. So watch this. What's going to happen when the trumpets blow? It's going to unseal the book for us. We'll become a new creature. Okay? Old things, amen, are passed away, and all things are going to become new for us. Okay? So I want you to, I, I want you to get that. That serpent is intended to be a picture not only of our flesh, sinful nature, but it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. He's not the devil, but he shows the defeat of the devil on the cross. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Okay? You want to remind the devil of, of his power over you? Just remind him of the cross. Okay? Because the cross is where Christ made a show of his enemies openly while he was on the cross. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. By the way, that story is in the book of Numbers, which is the fourth book of the Bible. John is the fourth book of the New Testament. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Finish that, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe the Bible this morning? Say Amen. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth where? Look at him. He is living inside of you. Somebody say amen. Look at this. Romans chapter 1, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. Start making a list, an inventory of your life. 
unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. How many of you have coveted something? How many of you have been malicious to your husband or your wife? Amen. Full of envy, murder, debate. There's, in fact, there's 23 things here that he which commits such things is worthy of death. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Sin came into the world by 46 worlds. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat the, every tree of the garden, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your, look at that word, eyes. If you were to count this out, you'll find that the word eyes is the 33rd word of this sequence. Does that have anything to do with this? And what eye do they want to open up? You've got two good ones here, amen? Actually, four. <laughs> they want to open up this third one here, don't they? There's a reason why, and I'll show you later. Then you shall be as who? Mormons. <laughs> Knowing good and evil. Romans 2.15, which show the work of the law, the Ten Commandments written where? In their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and the thoughts they mean while accusing or else excusing one another. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Who is your biggest enemy? Two. It's your flesh. Amen. That's, I mean, stop, stop and think about it. The handwriting of ordinances is in our hearts. It's our own conscience that convicts us, the Bible says. Amen? But Christ came to blot all that handwriting of ordinances out that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. The 46th chapter of the New Testament is Luke chapter 2, where Jesus came into the earth. Beautiful. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I like this. I want to close with this. Being born again, not of corruptible what? Why do I believe what I believe? Some people don't like me because I believe what I believe. I believe that this Bible's right. I do. I, I, I have, in fact, I go around the country teaching Bible numbers. You know what the only number you need to know is? Zero. Because that's how many mistakes there are in this book. It doesn't say the incorrupted word. It says the incorruptible. Did you know that the real word of God cannot ever be corrupted? Did you know that? In fact, I'll give you a picture of this. When Jesus' body lay in the tomb for two days, what happened to it? What happened to his body in two days? nothing the Bible says that God would not allow his his body to see what corruption if you've ever been my brother-in-law's county corner and our and I've helped him and I can tell you after two days they're starting to turn bad Jesus body lay in that tomb for two days and God watch this God would not even allow corruption to touch I like it his body Amen? And if God will not allow corruption to touch His body, which is the church, He will not allow corruption to enter in to His Word. This book is the perfect, inerrant, infallible Word of God. It does not need me to correct it. I, however, need to be corrected by it. Amen? I am not above it. It is above me. The final authority in my life is not my wife. And it's not my children. And it's not even me. The final authority in my life is a book that's written. And we shouldn't change it, should we? Okay? Should we change the Constitution? Uh-uh. Should we abandon it? Should we walk away from it? Should we act... Should we act like it doesn't exist? Okay? I want you to think about this and, and think about the, the blessing of God that He didn't just give us His Word in our feelings. He gave us His Word written down. 
so that there's a record so it cannot be changed. Ink and paper is like one of the most greatest inventions in the whole world because it's written down. You said you had a title deed. Is it just like a thought that you have? It's written down, unalterable, unchangeable. What is the final authority of our country? It's not supposed to be the president, is it? And it's not supposed to be the Congress or Barney Frank or Nancy Pelosi. The final authority in our country is not even supposed to be the judges. The final authority in our country is on a piece of paper called the Constitution. We the people... And it's written down. And when the president takes the oath of office, he does not swear to protect and defend the people of the United States nor the governmental powers of the United States. He vows and promises with his hand where? An unchangeable book that he will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And God has written it all out here in this book. And he's written it inside of us. Will you be one of those people in these last days who will stand for your brothers Israel as protectors of the title deed? Because you know what the real inheritance for Israel is? It's not that land. Abraham looked for a city. And we're going to talk about that in the next segment. We're going to talk about the cities. Okay? And what we're really talking about here. That's where Abraham looked. And when we say that we're protecting the title deed to the land for Israel, we're talking about the salvation of the brothers of Jesus Christ, whom he wants to come back to him. Do you believe that? Say amen. God bless you. Yeah, it's the word that's hidden. It's the lost word of Freemasonry because it's hidden, secret. Remember, this represents the, the word. It's hidden away. Good observation. Yes, ma'am. When Adam and Eve sinned, does that mean their DNA twisted? What is it? I don't know. I wasn't there and didn't have a microscope. Okay? <laughs> I will tell you that, watch this. And remember the illustration when DNA is going to go from one cell to the other, it's, it's opened up, it's straightened out. Okay, think of all the places in the Bible where the crooked can the, the Bible, the, uh, God asks, can the crooked be made straight? And the answer is yes, because what's the ministry of John the Baptist? To make the crooked things straight. Okay, so think of that. Think of think of the book that was in them, and the devil speaking his words. Okay, how are we, how are we saved by the words of God? How did Eve get lost? By the lost words of Lucifer in the Garden of Eden, the serpent. And every civilization in the world, for some reason, worships the serpent as a source of wisdom. Okay? We're going to talk about Kundalini after lunch. Okay? It's going to blow your mind. Okay? Anybody else? So, yes, it's possible that the book became closed. Okay? When, in the Garden of Eden. And that fruit... It's the Antichrist. Because cursed is anyone that hangeth from a what? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have that, but if it, if it works in there, I will. Okay, because Joseph Smith and all those guys, all the early leaders of the Mormon church in Nauvoo, Illinois, became Freemasons. Okay. And the same similarities there. Okay. They believe that they're going to become gods one of these days. By what? Sacred marriage. Hyros Gamos. That's what Dan Brown talked about in the Da Vinci Code. The union of male and female together to bring godhood. That's what Mormonism is all about. Okay? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Charles Taze Russell was a Freemason, and on his tomb, his tomb is a pyramid, and the capstone has a Masonic symbol on it. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. I don't, I don't need history books to tell me that he was a Freemason. All i got to do is look at his tombstone. I'm going, okay, that guy's a Freemason. We're talking about an inner circle being led by spirits. Okay? Um, when we come back, we'll, we'll, I'm, I'm going to start out with a conspiracy theory. How many of you believe in a conspiracy theory? 
And I'm going to show you one from the Bible that's going to make a lot of sense to you. It's very simple. It's just one verse, but it's going to make a lot of sense to you. When you if you believe that the guys in the lodge in this town are orchestrating the destruction of America, that's not necessarily the case. But there are spirits who are working through very evil men. Some identify themselves with Freemasonry. Some identify themselves in other areas like the Vatican and places like that. These are the ones being led because they're demon-possessed and they're being led by familiar spirits. They are orchestrating the destruction of the old world so a new world can have birth. Okay? Somebody else? Got a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. Every now and then, I used to. Yes, he is. Okay, and he makes that. I didn't know that until I uh, went to Wikipedia and looked at his bio. And then he mentioned deliberately on one of his episodes that he believes marriage is eternal. Okay, he's not telling the truth. Okay, and I want you to think about this. You might think he's a good guy and gives good news. But I will tell you, okay, that if he's not led by the Holy Spirit of God, what spirit is leading him? You have to remember this. There are only two types of people in the world, and they're not Democrats and Republicans. They are saved people and lost people. Amen? Okay? And you can believe in every conspiracy theory in the world and watch Jesse Ventura every week and die and go to hell. Yeah. You pray for it. Hey, pray that you get... You know what we do in our church? We pray that Barack Obama gets saved. Pray that Glenn Beck gets saved. Amen. Pray, hey, pray these people get saved that we don't like. Amen. Pray them into heaven. That way we like them. Amen. Let, let somebody else. Hang on. Anybody else have a question? Come on, pick my brain. Yes, sir. Okay, I will show you who is the head. Okay? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's the angels. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. That's the church. In the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Conspiracies in this world are not led by men. They're being led by Lucifer and his devils. That's who's leading the charge here, okay? And so you'll have groups here in the, in the New Age movement. You'll have groups in Mormonism, Freemasonry. You'll have them in the Republican Party, the Democrat Party. You'll have them in First Baptist Church somewhere around here, believe it or not, okay? They're everywhere, and they all don't know that they're working together, but if they're being led by the wrong spirit, they're on the opposite side of God's people being led by the Bible. So there's not one group called, I mean, I believe in the Illuminati, but that term is so used to, des to describe like a council of these rich men in Rome somewhere that meet and say, hey, let's do this and let's do that. You know, there is the Bilderberg meeting and all this stuff, but the, the principal idea is, is that these men are being led by spirits. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Somebody else. Yes, yes, sir. You had. Uh, on the King James Version, I'm relatively newly saved. King James is what I own. I, God led me right to it. I love it. It's just Good for you. Sings to me. When I talk to somebody else, like my 30 year saved Christian brother about the King James, the only version, mm -hmm. he throws things at me that I don't want him to have a chance. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me stop you right there. One of the things he will never do to argue with you is quote scripture. Not one time. He will never be able to quote a scripture to tell you that there are mistakes in the Bible. Okay? And that's at the core of his belief. Is that he believed that all the translations are faulty. Right? He believes there's mistakes in every one of them. Where did he get that doctrine? As a Christian, where did he get his doctrine? He got it from a Bible, a Bible college, a seminary, a commentary. He got it from some TV guy or somebody. But he did not get his doctrinal statement from the scripture. He needs two witnesses and he doesn't have any. Okay? So I'll just tell you, go ahead and finish what you were saying now. Yeah, so what he said to me was that none of them are inspired. Let me give you let me give you a verse, okay? We're doing just line upon line, precept upon precept. None of them are inspired. 
Um, 2 Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It didn't say was. It says is right now. And I want to tell you something. If the Holy Ghost does not breathe when this book is read, you're not saved. If the Holy Ghost does not breathe, that's, that's what God breathe means. Inspiration. Spirit. If the Holy Ghost, if uh, Pastor Penberth is up here and he's preaching his guts out, he's preaching you must be saved to enter the kingdom of God, he is doing so by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he's reading from this old book right here. And if he's preaching this old book, the Holy Ghost is knocking on your heart saying, you need to be saved, you're a lost sinner, you're going to go to hell. Amen? Okay? But the Holy Ghost will only breathe in the presence of an incorruptible book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, now... Finish. The one that I didn't know what to say to him was also was, he said, well, if you think you're reading 1611 version, but there's really like other ones that, you know, up to 17... I should have brought mine. I've got a 1611 King James Bible. It's a reprint by Thomas Nelson. Okay? I can stand up here and I can, pre I can preach every one of these verses I've had on the screen out of that 1611. It's exactly the same. The differences is, in the, in the earlier printings, they made typographical errors and spelling errors deals okay but the words I can read to you Isaiah 40 uh, 53 about Christ and I could read to you every word in that 1611 Bible and it would look and sound exactly the same as it looks in your Bible right now don't I used to go around telling people that same lie I say I know all the lies because they used to tell them okay and I'm telling you that it's the same Bible Okay, when they start telling you that, oh no, they, they changed all the words and you, you couldn't even understand that book back then, I passed that around like it was true and I didn't know it. My wife got me a 1611 Bible and I went, wow. It's the same. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became, I mean, it's the same book. Okay? So what are the, what are the typos that they're, that are there? I mean, what's an example of that? Um, in one place in the Psalms where it says God, it should say good or vice versa, I don't remember, things like that. You know, they hand put type backwards on a plate, okay? And so typographical errors were made at that time, okay? Yes, sir, in the back. So the J-dubs, too. They're really good. I got a biblical answer for that. You believe that? Okay. Um, I don't believe in my own wisdom because I don't have any. First uh, Peter chapter 2. Listen to this now. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore it also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Believers are not confused. Okay? Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. Is this Bible precious to you? Listen, I won't live without this Bible. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. God, there are stumbling stone verses in this book. You will think, and I'm going to give you two simple rules. Rule number one, there are no mistakes in the Bible. That's scriptural, and I can give you scripture to back it up. Rule number two, if you think you found one, refer to rule number one. Okay? The reason why people trip over the scriptures is because they're disobedient. That's exactly right. Amen. God is not a man that he should lie. Yes, sir. <laughs> they, they bred the philosophy that exists in seminaries and theology schools and in most pulpits in this country. 
is that the Bible is subject to the change of the, of the man reading it in original languages. That it is subject, the Bible is subject to the man and not the man subject to the Bible. They, they are the ones who really got that going in this country. And I want to tell you something. I've been on the other side and I don't like it. They were going to seances, if that tells you anything. Westcott and Hort were not Christian men. And they handled the Word of God deceitfully is what they did. They had it as their, their goal and intention to change the Bible. But they couldn't. Oh, they changed a version of it. But this King James still exists. Why? Because it's incorruptible. One more and then, yes ma'am. Yeah, the priest anointed his thumb with blood, okay? And think about a hand without a thumb. What can you do with it? Jesus said, without me, ye can do. And there's two bones here. Why? He's the Word of God. Old Testament, New Testament. He came first time. He's coming. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Sounds like God had everything... He didn't need us. Amen. <laughs> David, go ahead. Uh, do you want to uh, break now or do you want to and, and break for lunch or do you want to go for an, uh, another segment and break for lunch? Do I look like I don't need lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Let's eat some lunch. But anyway, numbers are important if you want to study the Bible. And we have some videos out here on the table that I've been sending to David Bay. It's a series that I've been doing. It's called How to Understand the Bible as a, as a Prophetic Word. How to Understand What the Bible's Talking About. Uh, the first one is called Understanding the Prophets. And you, you read the Old Testament. Read Isaiah. Read Jeremiah. Read those things. And uh, understand that what you see in the Bible as a fulfillment is a partial fulfillment the perfect fulfillment of what the prophet said is coming in the last days. You see themes of one and two, first thing and then second thing in the Bible, and that's all through there. The second part of it was um, understanding Bible typology. A lot of things that I teach, when I teach from the Bible, I teach, I teach a lot of typology uh, stories. So think about, um, think about David and Goliath, okay? David is a shepherd. Guess who he is a picture of? It's a picture of Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd, okay? Uh, Goliath, who has sixes all over him, guess who he is? David said, this uncircumcised Philistine is as a lion and a bear, and that's exactly the description of the beast in Revelation 13. So we talk about that. The third one in the series, we just released, David's got them on the table just today, it's called The Clouds. And I show the language structure of the King James Bible, and we was talking about this at lunch, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it, you'll have to get the video. Um, it's, a, it's just things that God has shown me over the years. Once I decided, once I decided, and, and I haven't really given my testimony much, haven't talked about being much, but I, a lot of you know I used to be on the other side of all this stuff. I was going to, I was going to be a liberal pastor. I was going to, you know, teach out of everything but the Bible. I was going to have a rock and roll band in our church. I was going to do all these things, and God whooped the fire out of me and said no. And uh, so he brought me to a place to where God forces us to believe in him. Amen? He will drag us through the pit and force us to live in hope. And that's what he's done with me. And God has forced me to believe every word of the Bible. I don't have a right to not believe the Bible. I don't have the authority to. I don't have the right to change the Bible. I just, I just look, I just take the Bible for what it is. It is the pure word of God. It has no mistakes in it. It is the final authority on everything. And the Bible is the revealer of men's secrets. You believe that? Because it's the light. And the light always reveals the secrets. It always does. Okay? So what I'm going to show you today, uh, I don't know if, I don't, if you're here, if you're a Mason, I want you to know that I do not intend to be your enemy. Okay? I intend to be your friend. 
Everybody in this room is a sinner. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Okay? So we, we, we might as well just admit who we are and understand that there is one way whereby a man can have eternal life. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. One way and only one way. And so I just want you to know that I love you. And, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things that you may not like. But I have to say them because God told me to. And I'm going to shine a light. And if you're in darkness, you may not comprehend it. Because darkness does not comprehend light. Okay? John chapter 1 tells us that. But I'm going to shine the light anyway. The Bible reveals the secrets. Look at this verse up here, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the what? Words. Do you think God would ever take part of his law and hide it from people and then say, how come you didn't do what I told you to? That wouldn't be fair, would it? So God made sure the law and his words were written down so that we could follow it. It would be like if you were pulled over by the Lexington police force and the cop saw you and he didn't like you. Does he have a right to arrest you or write you a ticket based upon the fact that he doesn't like you? He can only do what the law allows him to do. He can't make up laws. He can't invent laws. He can only go by what is written. Okay, so God reveals his words to us so that we can do what he tells us to do. He said in Isaiah 45, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So God is saying he's showing you how he speaks. God said, I have not spoken in secret. In a dark place of the earth. Think about this for a minute. Where's the beast right now? He's in a dark place of the earth. Okay? Just kind of keep that in your mind. Deuteronomy 30. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven. And let me stop right here. When, God, when Moses went up to the mountain and God gave him the law, what did, you know, we're talking about the second time, what did Moses come down when he had the law, what did he come out and do with the law? What did he do? He read it to everybody in the camp of Israel, didn't he? He read them all the words of the Lord. Did he just say, now I just want the elders, I just want the guys that are really close to the top here. And I'm going to give them the law, but the rest of the people, I'm not even going to bother. Did he do that? You see, that's what the Pope wants to do, isn't it? He wants to, he says, the Pope says that only the priest and the cardinals can really have the word of God and translate it right and, and interpret it right. You poor people in the church pews, you have no right to read, you have no right to interpret, you have no right to know the Bible. And that plunged the world into what we call the Dark Ages. And there, God raised up men like William Tyndale who wanted to publish the word of God so that light would shine in the darkness of the dark ages. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay? So this is, this is our God here. It is, not, uh, this, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But watch this now. Does this sound familiar to you? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Paul said that, didn't he? He was quoting that. The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth, even the word of faith that whosoever... So the, that is linked to how a man is saved. So God says... I'm, I want everybody to know what my word says. Amen? I want everybody to know. I want everybody to hear. I want, every, I want you as disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every living creature. No exceptions. None. Okay? That's because God wants everyone to have an opportunity to either accept 
or reject him. Isaiah 48, 16. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. I will tell you that if you want to hear God, you do need to get close. Amen? You do need to get close. Daniel chapter 2. He revealeth the deep and the secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. God is a revealer of very deep things and very secret things. He says in verse 30, But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. We're going to talk about that uh, here in a little bit. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. That, that leaves any other possibility out, doesn't it? Don't believe for a second. And these latter-day prophets who are getting visions and dreams and prophecies from God who are saying, well, God has given me some new thing. Don't believe it. You don't need it. Here is a sure word of prophecy. Let's say that, let's say that I, I came in here and I said, uh, David Bay said I could say this. I had a dream last night. God showed me in a vision something he wanted me to tell you people. Did you know that you have no way in the world of knowing whether or not I'm even telling the truth about whether or not I had a dream? You have no way of knowing. You don't know if I'm a liar, a scoundrel, a cheat. You don't know any of those things. But you do know what's in here, don't you? And if you don't know what's in here, all you got to do is open it and go like this to the TV and read it. Amen? Surely the Lord God will do nothing so I want us to take our Bibles. Let's slow down a little bit, all right? Genesis chapter 3. You all brought your Bible, right? Say amen. Okay. Because I'm not the Word. Genesis chapter 3. Look at what the serpent said. Now, the serpent was more subtle. That means secretive. Deceitful, very secretive. Okay? The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto her, He directly contradicts God's word by adding one word. He said, Ye shall not surely die. So right here, once you get this, he is promising her immortality. Okay? And then he says, for God doth know. Now, stop right here. Here is the basis of all mystery religions. God had already, in fact, can I show you something neat? You're in Genesis chapter 2, Look at verse 16 and 17. I can tell you because I've already counted this, because I count things, okay? I'm like monk, okay? I'm like obsessive compulsive. I just, I count things in the Bible, okay? Did you know, watch, did you know in your King James Bible, the exact number of words that God spoke to Adam, giving him the law, was 39 words. How many books in the Old Testament? It's the law, isn't it? Wow, is right. And there was only one sin because there was only one law, wasn't there? Okay? So now not only is the devil directly contradicting this law, because he's the opposite, right? God is righteous, he is unrighteous. He is also telling Eve that God has a secret doctrine that he did not reveal to Adam. Now that contradicts all the verses that we just read, doesn't it? God is, do you believe that God has revealed everything in the pages of this book? And how many of you today have seen things in the Bible that you've never seen before and yet they're there? Say amen. Okay? He reveals these things in the Bible. God is not, God's not going, I'm not going to tell you that. 
But the devil tried to get Eve, and he's still trying to get people to think now that God has a secret that only the serpent will reveal. Did you catch that? And the secret is, ye shall be as gods. Little g, which are angels. Okay? You shall be immortal. You should be as gods, knowing good and evil. So anyway, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. In Mark chapter 4, verse what? 22. What did we say the number 22 was for? Revelation. You know how many chapters are in the book of Revelation? That's pretty good. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. How many things will be kept secret forever? Not even your own sin. God shined a light in your life, didn't he? He exposed you to who for who you are. That's why you got saved. There is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Nothing. So God reveals secrets. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. Now watch this. What I tell you, this is Jesus now, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. You remember uh, the Discovery Channel or the History Channel, something like that, come out a couple years ago with a supposed lost gospel of Judas Iscariot. Does anybody remember that? Biggest bunch of baloney I've ever seen in my life, okay? Number one, Judas did not write the good news of Jesus Christ. But watch this. The book of Judas meant, was meant to look like that Judas and Jesus were actually working together. And Jesus went to Judas and said, Judas, we need to play good cop, bad cop. You be the bad cop so that I can be the good cop. And Judas, I have some secret doctrines that John the Baptist told me that I can't tell these other guys. But I'm going to tell you. But it's a secret. and You can't tell anybody. Okay? That's a lie, isn't it? Jesus said to his disciples, what I tell you, let's see, let's read it. What I tell you in darkness, speak in the light. The disciples would have been disobedient had they met together after Jesus died and rose again and said, you know, we can't tell anybody this. They would have been disobedient, wouldn't they? Okay? And then he said, what I, what I say in your ear, that's whispering, isn't it? You proclaim how? from the rooftops. You shout it out. You tell everybody. Okay? So, let's look at something real quick while we're here. One of the Masonic rituals has to do with a supposed secret name of God. Jah-Bul-An. Okay? Jah-Bul-An. And a Mason goes, and in part of this ritual, a Mason reaches over and whispers in his ear, Jah. And the Mason is instructed that he is never to reveal to anyone this. It's whispered in his ear, and he will risk having his throat slit from ear to ear, his stomach open, his bowels pulled out and burned with fire, and the ashes scattered to the four winds of the earth. That's the exact opposite of this verse. Amen? It's the exact opposite. Remember, here's, here's the Bible, the revealed word, the open word, the found book. And here is Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma representing the hidden book, the dead, the lost word of Freemasonry. Okay? So, as a philosophy, which do you find yourself accepting? The dead word, the lost word, the hidden word, the secret word that no one is supposed to know about. In fact, let me do this. Somebody asked me where I got this from. I went to a bookstore and bought it for 20 bucks. Morals and Dogma of the Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Here is Fat Albert's picture. Okay? <laughs> and 
And it says, esoteric book. What does that mean? For, it means secret. Don't tell anybody. For Scottish right use only to be returned upon withdrawal or death or recipient. Uh, death of recipient. Some widow did not do her job. Okay? She, her dead husband was a mason. She took his books, took them to the bookstore and said, here, take this. Okay? And I bought it. Now, I will tell you that I've read most of this book, 860 some odd pages. I've read most of this book. And I can tell you that I read this book looking for the secret of Freemasonry. It's not in here. In fact, I went to the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge, Washington, D.C., a 7,000 volume library of Masonic, Rosicrucian, Knights Templar, alchemical books. And I figured there's no way they're going to let somebody like me in there. I found out that I not only could go in the library, but I could ask for any book on the shelf and they'd bring it down and I could read it there and there. I could do that. You know why? Because they know out of 7,000 some odd Masonic volumes in that library that the secret is not written down one time in any of those books. Okay, what does that tell you? Here again, you have to decide what do you accept as a philosophy? Is your philosophy the fact that you have a idea that is so powerful and so earth shattering, that's what Albert Pike calls it, but no one can ever know about it? Or do you believe in a truth that will absolutely change a human into an immortal by the, by the gospel of Jesus Christ and you feel like you have an obligation to tell everybody? Which do you accept? Romans 16. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You know how many times the word mystery is found in the King James Bible? 22 times. And every time the word mystery is found in the Bible, it says the mystery is revealed. Behold, I show you a... We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh man, the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. How? By the scriptures of the prophets. According to the commandments of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. God wants everybody to be saved. Amen? And if we don't believe that, why do we send missionaries? Why do we ask preachers to go out and street preach? Why do we, why do, we do those things? Okay? It's because we believe that everybody should know. We have a religion. And in this, I read this church doctrinal, uh, doctrinal faith statement, and I love it. Okay? And I guarantee you there's not anything that this church believes that they have a council meeting and say, you know, we cannot let anybody know about this. Am I right, David? You can go knock, you can represent this church, go knock on the door of every door in Lexington, and they can say, now what does your church believe? And you're going, well, um, we're not supposed to tell him. You can tell him everything you believe. Amen? See where I'm going with this? We have also a what? More sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost I love that I found this quote from a, a book that I have It's called America's God and Country the Continental Congress September 11th 1777 Approved and recommended to the people that 20,000 copies of the Holy Bible be imported from sources other than England. Why? Because we just happen to be mad at England. Okay? This was in response to the shortage of Bibles in America caused by the Revolutionary War, interrupting trade with the King's Commission printers. The chaplain of Congress, Patrick Allison, brought the matter to the attention of Congress, who assigned it to a special congressional committee, which reported... The use of the Bible is so universal and its importance so great that your committee refers the above to the consideration of Congress. And if Congress shall not think it expedient to order the importation of types and paper, which means uh, the, the resources to print our own Bibles, the committee recommends that Congress will order the Committee of Commerce to import 20,000 Bibles from Holland, Scotland, or elsewhere into the different parts of the states of the Union, whereupon it was resolved accordingly 
to direct said Committee of Commerce to import 20,000 copies of the King James Bible into this country. Our Congress knew the Bible was so important that said, you know, since we can't buy them from England, we need to buy them from somewhere else, but we need to get the Bible into our country. Pale in comparison to, or compare that to, Barack Obama's transgendered commerce appointee. We've come a long way, baby. Amen. Now, I saw this billboard in Michigan, and since I had their permission to share the secret, I'm going to. Okay? Um, here's what Albert Pike says in Morals and Dogma. He calls the secret the grand arcana, which means great secret. He said, that secret whose revelation would overturn earth and heaven. Let no one expect us to give them its explanation. He who passes behind the veil that hides this mystery understands that it is in its very nature inexplicable and that it is death to those who win it by surprise as well as to him who reveals it. Well, I'm going to. The truth must be kept secret. That is not what this book says. So, I'm going to get a little heated up here. Because I'm a zealot for the Bible, people. I'm a zealot for, if God wants to reveal secrets, let Him reveal secrets. Amen? Okay? We, then, as Christians, do you believe, in, you believe, that, do you believe that philosophy? Say Amen. We then, as Christians, must live our lives as open books, epistles read by all men. That means cut out your secret sins. There went your amen in. See, you get me, you get a preacher too, okay? And I say that if we're going to call ourselves born-again Christians, then let's start living like our life is an open book. And we shouldn't have anything to hide. Amen? You know what? I'm an American, and I believe in our liberties, but I'm, I'm not as scared to talk on my cell phone. Amen? I've got nothing to hide. Okay? Or my emails, or anything like that. Masonry, like all the... This is Albert Pike again. Like all the religions, all the mysteries. So Albert Pike says, Masonry is a mystery religion. That's what he said. I didn't say that. That is what he said. Like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who... You know what he's saying? We lied. Okay? So you drive by the Mason Hall. You might be a Mason. And you have a square and compass on your ring. You're told in your lodge, which is the outer part, the visible lodge, you're told by the lodge that your square and compass represents the fact that was something about circumscribing your, act, your conduct and blah, blah, blah. You're told all this stuff. Okay? Albert Pike says, we're lying to you. We're not going to tell you what that square and compass means. You don't deserve it. And you'll go through all the degrees that we give you and you'll support the lodge and you'll drive the funny car with the fez and the parade and you'll do everything we tell you to, but we will not tell you our secret. And if you think you know, we're lying. We're lying. To conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it, truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or wouldn't pervert it. Now, this is where I get mad. Because over the course of years, God has shown me some pretty incredible things. And I can tell you, honest face, that I deserve not one bit of it. I don't deserve any, I don't deserve to be here. I do not deserve to be saved. I do not deserve to have God bless me. I do not deserve, I did not deserve the meal that I had today. I don't deserve anything. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. We deserve nothing. God's kingdom says, if you don't deserve it, you're the one I'm looking for. 
Masonry teaches you want to know what we have to say, you have to earn it. That's work salvation. Okay? And as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am against it. As a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says the blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. In other words, you're not getting in. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. Can you imagine a God that you want to serve all your life who lied to you? This is why I believe what I believe about this Bible. I refuse to serve a God who won't tell me the truth. Amen? I refuse it. He is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. So masonry jealously conceals its secret. This is from Morals and Dogma again. And intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. It is for each individual mason to discover the secret of masonry by reflection upon its symbols. And we're going to talk about symbols. Um, and a wise consideration and analysis of what is said and done in the work. Masonry does not inculcate her truths. She states them once and briefly or hints them perhaps darkly or interposes a cloud between them and eyes that would be dazzled by them. Seek and ye shall find knowledge and truth. Manly Hall said in the secret teachings of all ages, the book to which this is the introduction is dedicated to the proposition that concealed within the emblematic figures, allegories, see that word concealed, allegories and rituals of the ancients is a secret doctrine concerning the inner mysteries of what? He didn't say the inner mysteries of politics, did he? He didn't say the inner mysteries of rocket science. He said the, inner mystery, the secret concerns the inner mysteries of life itself. Remember what we learned a few hours ago. Uh, which doctrine has preserved in total among a small band of initiated minds since the beginning of the world. Departing, these illumined philosophers left their formula that others too might attain to understanding. But lest these secret processes fall into uncultured hands and be perverted, the great arcanum, great secret, was always concealed in symbol or allegory. Now, notice what a warning that God gives in the book of Deuteronomy concerning what uh, Albert Pike just said and Manley Hall said. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee how? Saying, let us go and serve who? Here's the junior warden sitting here. And here's the senior warden sitting here. And who sits here in the middle? The worshipful master. He's not supposed to be called that, and I'm going to show you the verse. Okay? So if he entices you secretly and says, let us go so... No, now no mason is going to invite another guy to a lodge and say, hey, we're serving other gods, come on. Because remember, they will not tell the truth in the lodge. They're told not to. Most lodge members don't even know that what they're believing is not true. So again, I don't want to be abrasive, abusive, rough, mean, or anything like that. All I want to do is shine the light. You decide whether or not you're going to follow it or not. Okay? Uh, namely, the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or are far off from thee, from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, neither hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Now, I'm not saying you should kill masons. <laughs> Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. The law was pretty mean, wasn't it? God, but God was pretty serious, wasn't he? God is not a God of secrets. Uh, and the children of Israel did secretly 
those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. Job said he will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons. You can believe this if you want, but one of the philosophies of masonry is we are a brotherhood and we look out for one another. How many of you know that to be true? Okay. So if you know what sign to flash, okay, you can get any kind of help you want from a fellow brother, including, including a get out of jail free card. And if you don't want to believe that happens, too bad. It does. Okay? It does. I watched an out-of-town lawyer come into the courthouse in our town, in our county, an out-of-town lawyer who did not know the judges and prosecutors there come in with his square and compass lapel pin on. Why? Okay? We're going to get a square deal, judge, aren't we? Okay? God said you're not supposed to do that. Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, as it were a young lion lurking how? Mm -mm -mm. And who's the lion? Now, let's look at a spirit of mystery. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Now, two spirits work in this world. Two spirits work in this world. And they're opposite of each other. God's spirit is masculine. God's not a woman. And God's not an androgyny. Kenneth Copeland says that God is both male and female. He is a false prophet. He is teaching people to worship Baphomet, but not the God of this Bible right here. And I, well, I said that in Baltimore one time, and a woman got mad at me. Woo! She was hot. Okay? So two spirits are at work. The Holy Spirit of God, which reveals. Jesus said... And when, he shall, when the comforter come, he shall show you all things. Amen? But this other spirit that works is not a man. It's a female spirit. Her name, Mystery Babylon. And her first name is what? Mystery. So she is in charge of secrets. and Keeping things in the dark. Keeping things not known as opposed to being known. So, um, let me do this again. If I were to show you this, okay, what am I showing? What am I doing? Now, it's a Masonic hailing symbol, right? Okay. But what does it mean? It's a call for help. Okay. So, if I'm stranded on the side of the road, okay, just wait for a Mason to come by and he'll give me help. Okay. But what does it mean? Okay, I know what it means. I know what it means. And I didn't find out what it meant from Albert Pike. I found out what it meant from Jesus. Because it's in the book. Okay? So, think about symbols. Now, they tell you, oh, this symbol means this, and this symbol means that, and all, you know, all this and that. Now, I'm going to show you some of those symbols in this presentation. But remember, Mystery Babylon will, will never reveal the truth. She will always lie. She will always conceal. So the spirit that was guiding Albert Pike when he wrote Morals and Dogma was what spirit? Was it the Holy Spirit of God which shows men all things or was it Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth? Okay? So anyway, Proverbs 5 says, Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, which is what? The Bible. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. So you go into the Blue Lodge and you see a square and compass and you see an altar and you see the junior warden, the senior warden, and you see the worshipful master and you're told one thing. But then you get up into the higher degrees and then you're told something else. Which is it? Which one was true? Okay. That's the spirit. That's how you identify spirits. Um, Proverbs 7. Solomon was standing out, looking out his window one night. And he watched Mystery of the Babylon, the great work. 
And he said, I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. When do prostitutes do their work? In the darkness, in the nighttime. Why? Because it's secretive. The prostitutes don't tell who they've been with. Amen? Okay? So, DC Madam. You know who I'm talking about? The prostitute who run a prostitution ring in Washington, D.C., selling the bodies of her girls to these foreign dignitaries and American dignitaries who had an extensive cell phone list. And finally, I don't know what it was, but somebody got ticked at her, and they were going to throw her in jail. And how did they find her body? Hanging. One sleeve up, one sleeve down. Okay, I thought I'd throw that in there. And beheld there met him a woman. Uh, behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Who's subtle, by the way? The serpent. So they work hand in hand. So I'm going to ask you a question. James three eleven says, "Well, that's thirty three. If you add them, multiply them together, I just now saw that. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter?" That's interesting because part of the core tenet of masonry is the fusion of things that are opposite together. Okay? So we have sweet water and bitter water. And God said all through the Bible, you're not supposed to fuse things that are opposite, right? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And God, he separated them, didn't he? God separated light from darkness. So I'm going to show you something here in a little bit that's going to show you the fusion of light and darkness together. Okay? So can a person, can you live your life as a Christian, as a totally dedicated Christian and a totally dedicated fornicator? Can't do it, can you? So the question is, can I hold to a philosophy based upon the Bible that is a philosophy of light and hold to a philosophy also of an organization that is a philosophy of darkness. Can I hold the two at the same time? Because you're going to end up with two guys in your life that you're going to call master. One of them would be Jesus and the other one would be the lodge master. And I would ask you the question, can one man serve Okay? See how simple this is? I mean, I'm not going to make it complicated. Let's just make things real simple because I'm not as smart maybe as you think I am. Okay? It has to be real simple, and this is what we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to show you. By the way, here's the cross over here. Amen? You like the cross? And this is a Masonic symbol. Okay? Um, skull and bones. Square and compass. Acacia. Do you know what that is? You know what this coffin represents? You know why there are four directions here? West, north, east, and south. Um, you know what this star inside this circle represents? Here's a triangle here. Here's some lettering here. Do you know what that means? Okay. You see, here's a scroll here. What does all this mean? And they'll never tell you what it means. Okay. So which, which do you want to be? You want to be a, 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 a sweet water person? Or a bitter water person. Wormwood. Amen? Okay, now. Let's talk. I'm going to cover some things. Just very, I say very quickly. There's no way I'm going to do anything very quickly today. Let's look at some, just some, some, what everybody knows about Freemasonry stuff. And let's examine it in light of the scriptures. Is that fair enough? Okay. So now, Masonry operates in degrees. When you come into the lodge, you are blindfolded because you don't know anything. You're in darkness. Now, masonry wants to bring you to light. And they want to bring that to you one step 
at a time. So in the Scottish Rite, you take the first three steps, which is the Blue Lodge, and then you go 30 more steps, hopefully to the top where you are 33rd degree Mason, and then you say that I have light now, okay? Or you're a York Rite, and you go through the three steps, but then you go 10 more up to the top, um, to the 13th degree of the York Rite of Masonry, and you are elevated now to where you were in darkness, and now you are in light, and you have to go through the steps in order to get there. Now, I can tell you that that is opposed to what is in this book. Does Calvary Baptist Church teach you that once you come down to the altar and get saved, that there's still some things you need to do after that in order to really be saved? Is that what this church teaches? If you do, I'm going to preach against it. <laughs> Being saved is a one-step process. You were a sinner in darkness, and now you've come to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you are saved, and you have the Holy Ghost, and we don't even believe that, well, you get saved, but you get the Holy Ghost later by putting your hand on the television screen. You don't teach that here, do you? Good. See, that's degrees, isn't it? Think about it. In God's kingdom, you either one or the other. But it's not a process. Especially, it's not a process by your own works or your own hand. Is that true? Look at what the scriptures say. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for our sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by how many offerings? He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. One is opposed to the other. Fellowship. You're in a lodge. And you call men brethren. That are A, neither your birth relatives. Or B, Christians. Does masonry accept non-Christians into the lodge? Sure they do. In fact, you go to the house of the Temple Lodge, Washington, D.C., and you, go, you see their altar in their main lodge room, their main temple room. You'll see an altar that has about six, seven, eight, or nine different holy books from different religions all over the world, and they're right there. Because masonry believes in the brotherhood of all mankind. Right? Okay? So you are now fellowshipping with people that are not saved. So can you as a Christian have fellowship with people who do not believe the Jesus of the Bible. Be ye not unequally yoked together with who? See, I could stop right there. The argument's so See, I'm asking you, do you believe the Bible? Okay? You say, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Mason. Are you really? Okay? I say, according to this book, you have to be one or the other. Okay? Be ye not unequally yoked together without unbelievers. For what fellowship hath what? With unrighteousness. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Who's Belial? Yeah, and concord is a contract. Did Jesus ever sign a contract with, with Satan? The devil wanted him to, didn't he? Worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms. Okay? And those two do not agree. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the... Remember what we learned a while ago? You're the temple of living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore do what? Come out from among them and be ye separate. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. Charitable works. Uh, somebody sent me an email yesterday. I picked it up at the airport. He lives in this area. He's a Mason. And he says, I'm a Christian. And he said, you're not going to Mason bash, are you? He said, because Masons do a lot of good works. 
And the reason why we know Masons do a lot of good works is because they let everybody in the world know that they do a lot of good works, don't they? Open the paper, you're going to see the Masons standing there with their picture taken with, with a big check given to such and such organization. And people say, oh, you know, the Shriners, you know, they build all these hospitals, they help all these kids. And, oh, I want to say wonderful people. Okay? Well, you know, it's, it's good to help kids. Jesus told us to, right? But how did he tell us to do it? See, there's a method for everything in our Christian life, isn't there? Take heed that you do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that you may have glory of men. See, that's glory of men right there. Uh, verily I say unto you, they have their reward, but when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. See, that's separation, isn't it? Uh, think of this. I'm just, I'm telling you the secret, okay? But anyway, that thine alms may be in, oh, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So God said, don't do it, okay? Now, here's a picture. This is a Masonic house of the Temple Lodge. Here's the junior warden, the senior warden, and here is where the guy, by the way, this is, guess how tall this is? It's 33 feet tall, okay? And so here, a man that is called the worshipful master. So you go into the blue lodge and you're knelt, you're blindfolded, and you kneel before a man that is called the worshipful master. Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even who? And ye are all brethren, and call no man your father upon the earth. That's at Roman Catholics that got it wrong too, amen? Call no man your father uh, upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters. Well, you know, in the case of some of these priests, it might be true. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> Neither be ye called masters. God said, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, the author and finisher of our faith said, don't let anybody call you master. Why should we question that? Why should that be, be some controversy in our mind? Okay? And I had a response from somebody that said, well, you know, we call them that, but we don't call call them that. Okay? That at the name of who? Why is it the name of Jesus ever spoken in the Masonic Lodge? Why isn't it? That's exact. That's what they say. They say, well, you know, we've got, we can't say Jesus. We got Jews in here. Come on. You know, what's wrong with you? I know you're a Christian and that's okay where you live, but we're all brothers now. We can't offend the, we can't offend the Muslims either. That sounds like the garbage that we hear coming out of the White House and the Congress and the Supreme Court, and every other place in the world, and even the pulpits now. Okay? To everybody but saved people, Jesus is an offense to them. So how can you have a philosophy, and I'm going to get deeper into this, how can you have a philosophy that supposedly makes you, you know, Masons say we're making good men better. How is it that you're bettered? when you are disallowed from pronouncing the very name that saves you. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue... By the way, where's the beast at? Guess what he's going to do one of these days. <laughs> Amen! <laughs> that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I'll say to you that if you don't want to do it now, your day is coming. Okay? Hmm. They do, I'm going to show you what this means. Okay? Oh, look at there. A three-headed snake. What's that doing up there? Masonic emblem. And here's the name, Ja Bulan, Ja Bulan, Ja Bulan. Okay? 
That is the, Masons say it's the secret name of God. Now, we know that, but we can't tell anybody that. Okay? So, Masonry says that all you people in your church, you're worshiping a God that you think is the real God, but he's not the real God because you're not pronouncing his name correctly. And, of course, the Masons will not tell you what that name is. Okay? Now, watch this. God, here's what God said. God said, in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of the other gods, even that prophet shall die. God said, don't speak the names of the other gods. That's what he said, okay? Prayer without mediation. When they pray in the lodge, they pray to who? The great architect of the universe, who is, you know, the provident one, the all-seeing one, God. But since they never mention the name of Jesus in the lodge, that means when they pray, they are praying without a mediator. They are praying directly to God. Does everybody follow that? Who can do that? Only Jesus could. Why? Because we're sinful. We are separated from God. We're filthy, nasty, vile, unclean, dirty. You want me to keep going? Backbiters, haters, malicious. We got a lot of that stuff in us, don't we? Amen? They cannot and will not pray in the name of Jesus. Therefore, they are trying to reach God without a mediator. The Bible says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by what? The lodge? The priest? Mary? For there is one God, and how many mediators? Between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You're not supposed to do that. What is that? No, it's a picture of a Masonic apron. You guys will get it right later on, all right? Okay? You know what it means? Masonic apron, we was talking about this at lunch. Okay? You go to, go to Masonic funeral, they will lay the apron over the casket. Why? Because Masonry teaches, and this is common knowledge. I'm not digging up something that nobody's supposed to know. I mean, this is what they'll put on the internet. Is that a, the, the, the apron is a symbol of the righteousness of a Mason. And they teach that when a mason stands before God, dressed in his apron, that God will accept him on the basis of what the lambskin apron represents, is that the righteousness of a mason. That's what they teach. But yet the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that what? It is the gift of God, not of, not of works, degrees, membership, lest any man should and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as what okay you remember Adam and Eve what did they clothe themselves with And was that good enough? No, it wasn't. God did not accept that, did he? God himself had to clothe them in order for it to be right. And a sacrifice had to be made and blood had to be shed. Isn't it sweet? And you know what? I'm a very weak individual. I don't have a lot of strength in me. And when you start asking me to perform, whether it's rituals or works or anything like that, I am bound to fail. I am glad that I have a faith that believes that by grace I am saved, by love, as opposed to works. Can I hear God's people say amen? Uh, you have your Bibles? I want to, start, I want to add this to uh, some of the slides we've got up here. Let me, let me move forward real quick. Um, let me get to... Let's leave that up there for a minute, okay? 
Uh, take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 10, if you would. Genesis chapter 10. Let's bring God in here and see what he's got to say about it, all right? I want to I wanna get you to understand uh, the way God speaks in this Bible and what he's teaching us about what is going to befall us in the last days. Now, I will tell you that most prophecy is best understood after it happens than before. Amen? Okay? I mean, here you have Joel chapter 2, and it's been in the Bible all this time, and yet nobody really gets it until Acts chapter 2, and it happens, and Peter says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay? And, uh, I mean, Jesus told his disciples, you know, the Son of Man's got to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, uh, I'm going to be buried three days, and I'm going to rise again. And they go, it goes right over their head. Until it happens, and they go, he told us that. I can't wait sometimes for these things to happen. And I'm talking about the blessed hope and glorious appearing and all the things that go with it. Because then we will know, even as we are known. Amen? But God will keep us on the trail. He will keep, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And I want you to know, somebody showed me this the other day. And when he said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, God's light usually shines about one step at a time ahead of us. How many of you know that to be true? Now, we can see the light at the end, and we believe the word of God that we're going to heaven. That's prophecy, by the way. Amen? If you believe that you're going to heaven when you die in a future time, that's prophecy. But usually, most things, God only shines us one step at a time. That way, we learn how to walk how? In faith, trusting Him all the way. Okay? But I, God, I am going to show you some things that God has shown me. Uh, numbers and typology and things like that all come into play here. You're in Genesis chapter 10, say amen. 10 is the number for what in the Bible? Does anybody know? It's the number for dominion. How many commandments are there? Ten. The law hath dominion over a man, right? Okay. And uh, when the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt, who had dominion over them then? Pharaoh did. And who put Israel under Pharaoh's dominion? I want you to get that. Why did you do some of the stupid things you've done in the past? Who led you there? God did. Why? To force you to cry out for freedom. Isn't that the truth? Okay. So, anyway. Here's what I... The, the number 10 is the number for dominion. How many toes do you have? My dad has seven. His diabetes. Okay. <laughs> He's still doing well, okay? We have 10 toes. So... If I was asked uh, the brother here to come up here and lay down on the stage and I were to stand on top of him, who's in charge? 300 pounds on his head says, I'm in charge. Amen? Okay. Oh, Pastor Mike, you don't look 300 pounds. <laughs> you don't look an ounce over 295 and a half. Okay. <laughs> Genesis chapter 10. There are 70 nations here. I counted them. There are 70 nations. These nations are prototype. These nations are the ones who are going to be represented during the millennial reign of Christ. How long does the millennial reign of Christ last? 10 times 10 times 10. See how it works? The most holy place in the wilderness tabernacle was 10 cubits this way, 10 cubits this way, and 10 cubits this way. God's in charge, amen? Okay, all right, so here we go. But in Genesis chapter 10, this is where we find the first king in all the earth. And guess who it was? Verse 6, the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, and Foot, and who? Canaan. The sons of Cush, uh, Seba, and Havila and Sabta, and Reama and Sabtika, and the sons of Reama Sheba, and Dedan, mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. And Cush begat who? Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Who knows a little bit about the story of Nimrod and his, like, his mother, wife? Semiramis. Okay? Now watch this. There was, I, I, Flipped out the other day because I capture and record TV commercials for it on our broadcast. 
And I caught this one the other day. Uh, Britney Spears has a new perfume out. And the commercial for this perfume says, at, at one time there was a mighty hunter who fell in love with a goddess. And I'm going, I know who that is. Solomon said in Ezekiel, that which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. We can, if we look at the past in the Bible, we can see the future. Okay? So anyway, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, in the beginning of his kingdom, first time in the whole Bible you'll find that word, kingdom, was, let's count, Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. So we're establishing, God's showing us a pattern here, okay? The first city ever built, do you know in what chapter of the Bible it was built in? Genesis 4. Um, Cain had a son named Enoch, and he named, he built a city, named it after his son, Enoch. Okay? We're going to talk about cities later on. Okay? But I want you to notice this number four here, and Babel being part of that. Um, and out of the land uh, went forth Asher and built a Nineveh, and okay, blah, blah, blah. Take your Bible now and turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Thank God for bifocals. I got my first pair this year. Bifocals always go along with a bad back. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse uh, 19. God is giving Israel instructions, and they're, they're fixing to go into the land. He's giving them instructions, and I want you to think about this. We mentioned it earlier. The real city that Abraham was, the real country that Abraham was looking for was not Israel, okay, or the land here. I mean, although that is typical of it, the fulfillment is heaven, okay? Because God told Abraham, after the deal with Lot in Genesis 13, there's a number there, and I'll show you why in a minute. God, after Lot took his people to the well-watered plains of Sodom, God took Abram and he said, now look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. How many places? And he said, everything that you set your eyes on, I'm going to give you. Now, you and I standing here on a piece of ground, this area out here is pretty flat. It's not like where I'm from in Missouri. You can kind of see for a distance if it wasn't for the trees. When he's looking in those four directions, what is he seeing more of than he is land? Okay? I want you to think about that. Okay? How is New Jerusalem built? It's a city built how? Four square. Okay? God's teaching you something. All right? Um, so anyway, watch this now. Uh, verse 19. And lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon... And the stars, and all the host of heaven. How many? Shouldest be driven to worship them, and serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided into all the nations under the whole heaven. Uh, he, so he said, don't look to those four to worship them. Remember that Masonic emblem we saw a while ago with the coffin and the four directions? That has everything to do with what I'm showing you. Okay? Uh, look over here in... Um, Verse 27, uh, look at verse 26. I call heaven and earth witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but it shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. You shall be left few in number among the heathen whither the Lord shall lead you. And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, hear, eat, or smell. Four things. What are these gods? Okay. Why are they associated with this number four? Um, look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee. Let's count. The Hittites, Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. How many? Seven. How many heads does the beast have? And he says, seven nations 
greater and mightier than thou. What nation are we talking about? Are we talking about an earthly nation or a spiritual one? Let's count one more thing. Ephesians chapter 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm going to show you some things on that later on. So you understand this number four a little bit now, don't you? That this four is showing you the spirit world, spirit realm. Four gospels that brings us from this life to what? The spirit life, the next life. Okay, It all makes sense. It all matters. It's all part of the plan, the structure that God is laying out for us in the scriptures. Okay, uh, So now, let's see, where do we want to go here? Let's go to Daniel chapter 2 very quickly. All right? Daniel chapter 2, because this is, gonna, this is laying the framework for the secret. I'm giving you a crash course on numbers and what they mean. I could go into a lot more detail, but we already have a video. It's out on the table. Okay? Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And the image his head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet of part iron, part clay. So we have kingdoms. We have one, two, three, four kingdoms. Verse 40 says, and the fourth kingdom. Okay? So we've already laid a pattern here for this number four and what it means. So is this kingdom that Daniel sees in this vision of earthly origin or spiritual origin. This fourth kingdom is what Paul said we're fighting against. Our fight is not with Barack Obama. Because if it was, then we would want him dead. We don't want him dead. We want him saved. You better say amen to that or I'll turn this tape over to the secret service. I don't want the man dead. I want him saved. My fight's not with him. But he is the president, and so therefore a spirit called a principality is at work. A prince. So are, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's this fourth kingdom. Okay? So does everybody understand that so far? Okay? So when I tell you that they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men, you're going to go, that's really weird. Okay? But that's what I'm going to show you. Uh, I, I'm cutting out some things, but I did, a, I did a study on the word secret because I wanted to know the secret. And since Albert wasn't going to tell me what the secret was, okay, I decided to go to the one who I was pretty sure knew what the secret was. And I've read, I'm like David B. I've read books, okay, I've read Masonic books. I, I, I watch National Treasure. Okay? I mean, I did all that stuff looking for the... I read the Da Vinci Code. I read the Lost Symbol. I mean, I read everything I get my hands on, and nobody wrote that secret down except God. Okay? So I studied the word secret in the Bible. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my what? It's the most holy place. Why, why was it a secret in the Old Testament? No one was allowed to go in there, were they? When did that all change? And the veil was torn asunder. Amen. And now we know what that secret place represents. It's our cells where our chromosomes are stored. They shall pollute my secret place, for the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. We're not supposed to defile the temple of God, are we? And can we defile the temple of God by eating bacon sandwiches? You better not say amen, because I saw some of you do it at lunch. I wouldn't do it, okay? And everybody makes up something. Oh, that's defiling your body. You shouldn't eat that. That's defiling the temple of God. You know what? Breathing air nowadays defiles the temple of God. We cannot escape the vanity that we have to live under in this earth, can we? 
And there is no single food or conglomeration of food substances in this world that will keep you from dying. You're going to die. Amen? So what does he mean when they defile the temple? How did Manasseh do it? How did King Manasseh do it in his day? He took a god and he put it in the most holy place, didn't he? And that tripped God's trigger, didn't he? God said, okay, I'm done. You guys are going to Babylon. Okay? Follow me on this? That's how, you defi that's how, that's how it was defiled. Follow the Bible. Okay? Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, including an obelisk, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the who? Does that mean you shouldn't use craftsman tools for the mic? No. And putteth it where? And all the people shall answer and say that they would desire the mercies. Here's Daniel, of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. So Daniel's going to tell you the secret, okay? Uh... Daniel 2, verse 43. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. What are we made out of? Thank you. They, the fourth kingdom, shall mingle themselves with what? And what is the seed of men? Deoxyribonucleic acid. It's what you pass down to your children, and they're passing down to their children. That is the seed of men. It's our DNA. They shall not, but, they, but it won't work. They shall not cleave one to another. Because if God says it's separate, it's separate. No law can change the law of God, can it? Nothing can. So God said it won't work. They shall not cleave one to another, <clears throat> even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, <clears throat> they are equal to the sons of God. Why do I say that? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6. Who are the sons of God? Job said they were angels. Now, I'm not going to argue with Job. Amen? He said, they were, he said they were angels. You go read it. Okay? And when the sons of God are mentioned in the Bible, they're angels. Okay? You have to go outside of the scriptures to get a different interpretation of Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God. You say, well, angels cannot marry. No, they're not allowed to. That's why God charged them with a crime. They left their first estate. Their estate was they were not supposed to marry. But those angels left that estate. And what happened to them? Did they get cast to the earth? No, they got put in hell in chains. And they're there right now. And they're waiting a key to let them out, aren't they? Revelation chapter 9. Are you with me so far? Okay. So they are the sons of God. They are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, fallen angels. Pike and others, and numerous, numerous Masonic texts, use phrases such as heavenly, above, male, light, or Osiris. Okay? Sons of God. And in Genesis 6, they mated with who? Daughters. See the opposite? Sons of God in heaven and daughters of men on earth. That's opposite, isn't it? Okay? The seed of men is man's DNA, daughters of men. Pike and others uses phrases such as earthly. Why? Because in the King James Bible, the earth is always depicted as a what? A female. She hath opened her mouth. Okay? Uh, that's in Genesis chapter 4. And by the way, she's very bloodthirsty. And by the way, the spirit of the earth, Gaia, does not like man having dominion over her. That's what this earth in the balance is all about. That's what this environmental movement is all about. That's what the Copenhagen... Did you know, did you read the Copenhagen Treaty? It specifically equated the environmental movement with gender equality. It's written in there. I put it on a broadcast, okay? It's written in there. The earth is a woman, and God gave the man dominion over the earth, and she doesn't like that. And so when you start hearing about population decreases and the Georgia Guidestones, 
We have to get these pesky human beings off this planet. They're killing her. Am I right? That's the spirit that is working right now. Okay? The spirit that's leading Al Gore. You know that good Southern Baptist guy? Pike uses phrases such as earthly, below, female, darkness, Isis. The result is Horus, their son, the illuminated man, the perfected man, making good men better. God. Other words for this, fusion, hybrid, synergy, new level, new world. A new world order is about the result. Okay? So what does this mean? I want you to notice the design. We have something pointing up and something pointing down. And then we have the result of what happens here. And so Albert Pike says, the square, therefore, is a natural and appropriate symbol of what? The earth. Because why? Because it's pointing down. And the compass is an equally natural and appropriate symbol of the heavens. Why? Because it's pointing up. The compass is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity and the square of the productive earth or universe. So, pointing up and pointing down. You guys want something brand new that's not on any video I have? You want something brand new? As it was in the days of... So much is packed into that. Okay, that is a deep, deep thing that Jesus said. I love it, okay, because I love studying it. Um, all through the Bible, especially the book of Psalms, you'll see phrases like flood, the flood of ungodly men, the floods have compassed me, the floods have overcome. And all this, all this, okay? You see that happening, you see that in the scripture, okay? Now watch this. There's going to come a time when there is going to be an invasion upon planet earth of angelic beings, okay? The fallen angels, those that are being reserved in the pit right now, being loosed up. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 12, the dragon takes one-third of the angels and he does what with them? Cast them down to the earth. So they're, watch this, they're coming from two directions. They're falling from heaven and they're rising up out of the pit. From what source did the flood cover the earth? Fellows rain and the fountains of the great. Isn't that something? Uh-oh, now we have a new meaning for that, don't we? The rains came down and the floods came up. Okay? So, here it is again. This is the opening chapter to Morals and Dogma. And so we see something pointing down and something pointing up. Okay? It's a symbol of the square and compass, but it is something more than that. And we'll find out later on what that is. So I'm just going to talk about symbols. So here is the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. And on the inside of it, it says, Masonry builds its temples where? So in all the, the parables of Masonry that you learn in the Lodge, they talk about building the temple, building Solomon's temple. Remember what we learned already about Solomon's temple. And what is the temple according to the Bible? It's the human body. So masonry is going to rebuild the temple. Okay? Think about it. Uh, by the way, here is the, uh, this, like I say, this is the House of Lodge Temple. It's an odd-looking building. It has a Greek Parthenon and then a step pyramid. There are 33 pillars here. And there are 13 steps up here. Who's really good at math? Yeah, let's keep it simple because I don't know how to multiply. It's 46. How many chromosomes do we have? Here is the Masonic Temple in McAllister, Oklahoma. Pastor, I was preaching revival down there. Pastor said, Mike, you've got to see this thing. This thing's weird. This is a temple. And on the front porch of this temple, you walk up there. And when you look to the left, you see the image of the sun and a male and light. And it says, let there be light. 
And on the right, you see the image of a woman and the moon and darkness. It's opposites, right? Sons of God, daughters of men. The angelic beings mingle with the seed of men. Light, what fellowship hath light with darkness? God said there is no fellowship, and yet they have a Masonic temple that fellowships them together in one, get this, in one temple. Do you get that now? The one temple is the fusion of opposites together. See that double-headed eagle? Albert Pike says, you know, one's facing one way and one's facing the other. That's because one represents the male principle and the other one represents the female principle. And they have how many bodies? One. And what is their number? Thirty-three. Why? Why that number? Okay. Well, let's, let's, go ask, let's go ask God. Because God said in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That's what God said, didn't he? So you know what? I did. I asked him. I did not. You know, David Bay's got some great videos back here on the on the American Secret Beginnings, all this stuff. And there's a guy that he interviews from, from this Masonic Lodge in Washington, D.C. named Brent Morris. I guarantee you, I will not be able to call Brent Morris and ask him what this means. Amen? But I can't ask God. In Joshua chapter 12, Joshua is detailing the number of kings that were in the land of Israel that they had to get rid of so the Israelites could move in. Moses killed two of them. One of them was a giant. Moses killed two of them, and Joshua killed 31 of them. How many does that make? And these all withstood the armies of Israel who were in the land. Remember, what is the land? The real land that God wanted them to inherit was heaven. Okay, these all withstood the armies of Israel. Okay, so that they had to have them killed so they could possess the land. Here's another one. Here is Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, and 32 kings with him. How many does that make? That's why there's a difference between most Masons reach the 32nd degree. Very few ever actually get to the top, the 33rd degree. There's a difference. And so Ben-Hadad represents the Antichrist. The 30 and 2 kings with him, and I'll show you this here in a little bit. The 32 and kings with him represent the armies of human beings that have been fused together with the seed of angels. They meet together in a land called Armageddon. And who are they trying to fight against? Jesus. That's such a stupid idea. Amen? Have you ever fought God lost? <laughs> Amen? So now we, now we know, don't we? We know what this number means. Here's another one here. How old was Jesus? Why? Because that's how he defeated his enemies. In the war. Amen? Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. The phrase the beast is mentioned 33 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. Who's the beast? So now you know what this number represents, don't you? Three is the number for sin in the Bible. You say, I thought it was the number for God, the Trinity. Oh yeah? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And he is the man of sin, the double three. Here is a Masonic symbol. This is on the outside of that temple. It's a circle with a point in it. And it has two lines down the side. I'm just going to show you what they mean. Is that okay? Okay? I'm going to show you what they mean. I'm not going to make this stuff up. I'm going to show it to you from Albert Pike, and I'm going to compare it with the Scriptures. Okay? So here is the circle with a point. It's called, Dan Brown called it the circumpunct in his uh, book, The Lost Symbol. Here are the two Johns. This is John the Baptist, and this is uh, St. John the Evangelist, okay? And why these two guys here? Well, I don't really know all that for sure, but I will tell you that this John is rough. 
He represents the rough ashlar or the rough stone in the Masonic Lodge. He represents the male. This line represents the spring equinox. This line represents the autumn equinox. Days that are balanced. Anytime something is balanced, it has two things that are equal. Sons of God, daughters of men, and they're equal. Do you understand that? So the equinox is the day when there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. That's why pagan customs are carried out on the vernal and autumnal equinox. Because it represents the fusion of the two kingdoms together. And isn't that neat? Okay? But John is feminine. Have you seen the Da Vinci Code? The person who was supposed to be John in Da Vinci's painting was a chick, wasn't it? It was a woman. The sons of God and the daughters of men, male and female fused together. Now, Albert Pike, now this is the female, the outer circle. This is the male. So Albert Pike says the hieroglyphic of the younger Horus, remember the offspring, was a point within a circle. See the balances here? How many chains? So here we have three and we have three. What does that make? It makes six or 33, however you want to look at it. Okay? Fused together. Opposites. See the hand here? Three fingers pointing up, two pointing down. This is the male principle and this is the female principle. The heavenly and the earthly. Um, Chris Pinto and David Bay constantly referred to this in their videos as as above so below, okay? And that's what it means. The, earth, the heavenly mated with the earthly together in one hand. And how many fingers do we have all together? Well, we have five. Come on, let's just say five, okay? We have five. We'll learn about that here in a little bit. The rose cross, okay? This is, that rose is a symbol for the female. Some of these symbols are pretty vulgar. Okay? I'm just telling you right now. This is a symbol for the female. The cross is a symbol for the male. And they are fused together. And what did we learn last time what a cross was? Chromosome. What does a rose have on it? So we have thorns fused into the chromosomes. Symbol for the female, the symbol for the male. Rosicrucian doctrine says the manner and the means by which the present day man is transformed into what? The divine Superman. Did you watch Superman Returns? He is a God that fell to the earth. He made it with a human woman, Lois Lane, and they had a son, a hybrid. This symbol, the Christian rose cross, shows the end and aim of human what? I don't believe in evolution, do you? So as a Mason, why would you belong, why would you attain a degree in Masonry of the degree of the rosy cross? Or the degrees of the rose croix? Why would you do that? When they believe that man is on his next step of evolution. And evolution, watch this, Freemasonry and evolution go hand in hand. Freemasonry says you achieve divinity by steps. Evolution teaches the same thing. Okay? Uh, the, sol uh, the solution of the world mystery, man's past evolution, present constitution, and particularly the secret of his future development. What in the world do they have in mind? Let's look at triangles for a minute. Why a triangle? Uh, you can't see this very clearly, but in Masonic temples, they'll have the altar here, and there is a candle here, a candle here, and a candle here. Three of them making a triangle, but not any triangle, a right angle triangle. Now, I'm going to talk more about a triangle or the all-seeing eye and the capstone and the unfinished pyramid here in a little bit. But simply put, Pythagoras is the one who decided or figured out that in a right angle triangle, you have the formula of A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Albert Pike says that this part represents the male. This part represents the female. So guess what this is? It's their divine child, the divine Superman, making good men better. So here is Hor uh, Horus, here is Isis, and here's their child. So take a good look at this, because here in the lodge, 
you have a chair here and a chair here and a chair here. A chair here, a chair here, and who's in the middle? The identity of your worshipful master, the divine Superman, Horus. Here's what Albert Pike said. The sun and the moon represent the two grand principles of all generations. The active and passive, the male and the female. There he is. He's admitting it. He's just not telling you exactly what it means. The sun represents the actual light. He pours upon the moon his fecundating rays. Both shed their light upon their offspring, the blazing star or Horus. And there form the great equilateral triangle, in the center of which is the omnific letter of the Kabbalah, by which creation is said to have been affected. You know what the Kabbalah is? Jewish mysticism, it's everything that God told the Israelites not to learn from the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, that when they got there, they went, ooh, that is cool. They learned it, and they fused it with the doctrines that God had given them. What a shame. Amen? What a shame. But so, so Albert Pike, I mean, he thinks the Kabbalah is great. He thinks it's wonderful. Is that right? No, it's not. Okay? Uh, let's see. Here's the great lights here. Junior warden, or senior warden, and the worshipful master. One, two, three. We have patterns of one, two, three. The, the number three, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Follow this pattern in the scripture. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth. What did Eve see on the tree of knowledge of good and evil? By the way, it's the tree of knowledge of what? Good and evil are fused together. She saw it was pleasant to the eyes. It was desire to make one wise and it was good tasting. That's what she saw. Okay, good for food. So that's why the number three is so important in these things, all right? Um, you want to know what it means now? Right, left, middle. You have the same thing with a triangle, okay? Um, let me get to a triangle here. You have right, left, middle. You have right, left, middle. Junior warden, senior warden, worshipful master. So the hailing symbol... Sons of God, daughters of men, Horus, Isis. Yeah, the divine child. Okay? The God man. When they mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what the Masonic hailing symbol means. Aren't you glad you know now? Yeah, did I say that wrong? Here is Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Am I right? Here, here, and here. Gene Roddenberry was a Mason. And who is he? Where's my Trekkies? Come on, admit it. And what is he? No. He's a hybrid. He's half human and half alien. And he's green. That's exactly right. That's what he represents. And he's, he's showing you the sign, isn't he? Okay? Look at this guy here. When you go into the Blue Lodge, this is how you look. Masons call it naked and yet dressed. But which is it? <laughs> Stupid. They're fused together. One sleeve rolled up, one sleeve rolled down. This is, this is opposite of this, isn't it? And this, being bare, is opposite of this, isn't it? And this is opposite of this, isn't it? The fusion of the opposites together. The male, the female, the male, the female, the male, the female. All fused together, and boy, this guy is blind, isn't he? Yeah. And why does he have a noose around his neck? Why? Because cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. Amen? Cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. The rough ashlar and the smooth ashlar. Rough is the opposite of smooth. 
Rough is how a mason is before he becomes a mason. Freemasonry, by the tools of masonry, makes him perfect. That's why they're wrong, because they don't make men perfect, do they? Remember Jacob and Boaz? See this J and this B here? That does not stand for Jim Beam. Remember what we said Jacob and Boaz represented? 23 cubits tall? There were the chromosomes where our DNA is stored. So they, Masons say, well, you know, our secrets are inside of here. Now we know what they mean, don't we? They mean DNA. By the way, <clears throat> look at the winding ivory here to show you that it's linked with DNA. Here's the sun and here's the moon, <clears throat> and they are fused together. Potter, which means father, mater, which means mother. Notice that we have superior here, <coughs> excuse me, inferior here. You can't really see it. Here's a triangle pointing down. Here's a triangle pointing up. Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons, sons of God, daughters of men. Um, sons of God, daughters of men. They're fused together here in the middle. Here is the rainbow or the golden arch or the, um, the archway of the uh, royal arch of Freemasonry. One coming from this side, one coming from this side, and they're joined together by what, what does that look like up there? The keystone. They're joined together. How? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Are you learning any secrets today? Amen? Could that vine going around there be a, a representative of the, of the third strand? Um, this is the two strand. Here's the, here's the third strand here. The joining together. What joins them together? Okay. Well, what makes them perfect? How many degrees did we say was here? Scottish right? And how many were here? We already had that together, didn't we? 46. It's the number of chromosomes where our DNA is stored. How many spines do we have in our backbone? Those of you who have a backbone. Okay? So this is called, Tom, you were talking about a while ago. This is called Kundalini. This is something that came over the boat from, the Beatles kind of brought that over here because they were worshiping all these gurus. You remember that? Okay. Um, Eastern mysticism has destroyed American Christianity because the practices that are being done in most churches today, contemplative prayer, centering prayer, are nothing more than kundalini reformed. Kundalini teaches that you have a serpent at the base of your spine. Okay, and you, that serpent, remember, serpents are wisdom. That serpent, through the right practices, rituals, what do Masons perform every time they get together? Rituals. Show me a ritual in the Bible that makes you saved. No, not one, no, not one. Okay, so anyway, they believe that through the right rituals, the serpent will uncoil itself and writhe in a spiral fashion, like DNA, up the 33 bones of your spine to put its head into your pineal gland to open up. Now watch this. You have two eyes, right? Unless you're like me. You have four. You have two eyes. Okay? That represents your two-strand DNA. The third eye they want to open up makes you the God-man. Does everybody understand that? And it forms a triangle, doesn't it? One, two, three. Kundalini. Um, Leonard Sweet is a new ager that's embedded in the church. Him and Rick Warren are like this. And Leonard Sweet, in, in one of his books, talked about how the spirit comes into you like Kundalini's fire. He's a practicing warlock. And he is teaching right alongside Rick Warren and infiltrating the church. Certain men have crept in unaware, haven't they? But that's what Kundalini is. The lambskin apron, see the triangle, and the square, okay? Four is the symbol for the earth. Triangle is the symbol for the heavens. So you have the heavens mingled with the earth. There's a square and compass. And by the way, you have, another, you have a number here. Four plus three equals what? How many nations were they supposed to drive out? 
How many heads does the beast have? The spirit of Antichrist's number is the number seven. That's why that is. So the fusion of the four and the three, I mean, this is simple. The fusion of the four and the three make what? The seven, the beast rising up out of the sea. So a square and compass on top of a Bible. What did we, what did we, what did we say the Bible was? A picture of in our bodies. Our DNA. Albert Pike says that the square and compass, here we go, that when the square of compass lays upon or rests upon the pages of the Bible, it forms the blazing star. What did we find out a while ago was the blazing star? The blazing star was Horus, who was the offspring of Osiris and Isis. The two coming together to make the three. Okay? So watch this. This is our, this is your DNA. And they've added something to it, haven't they? I'm a Mormon, I'm not really, but I'm a Mormon. And I believe that the Bible is the word of God. But I also believe that the Book of Mormon added to that makes me a God. You get it, don't you? Okay. The number eight, this is the infinity symbol. These are opposites and they are fused together. And why does it look like a number eight? Because the beast thou sawest was and is not, and he is the... So I'm glad you guys know your Bible. This makes it a whole lot easier. Okay? He is the eight and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. That's his symbol. As above, so below. Pointing up, pointing down. Fused together in one body. Here it is again. Fingers up, fingers down, pointing together, the same hand. The same, oh, by the way, this is in Eliphas Levi's book. And notice the silhouette. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Here's another one from Eliphas Levi's book. As above, so below. Here we have a triangle here, that's three. Here we have a triangle here, that's three. So that makes 33, or actually, this is a what? A hexagram. So it makes the number six. You want to know what the number six means? Go read Genesis 6. Sons of God, daughters of men. And they created a super race, didn't they? That which was is that which shall be. Um, he is white, he is black. This is air, this is water. Here's something pointing uh, down. This is pointing up. The tools, the triple crown here. And we have a symbol called the Ouroboros. A serpent swallowing its tail. Albert Pike said it's the eternal symbol of, it's the symbol of eternal life or immortality. The serpent swallowing his tail is described as the tail is the male and the mouth is the female. You want to belong to something that has that? Okay, sons of God, daughters of men, bringing immortality. Ye shall not surely die, the devil said. Uh, Crystal Link says it is a strong relation to what is known as the androgyny. The androgyny is the united male and female principles together. This is the prime primordial end to human endeavor, the reunion which births totality and creation. It is not unlike the idea of androgyny, which is a duality complete, a return to wholeness. What does DNA look like? This is the Masonic ladder. Notice in this illustration, you even have them angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. So this ladder represents DNA. DNA is the bridge that fuses the earth with the heavens. Okay? Of uh, the black and white checkerboard floor. What does that mean? This is light. This is darkness. And they are fused together. Here's the rough ashlar. It's held by what's called a Lewis key. It has three parts to it. I won't get into that. The point within the circle and the two lines. Uh, here, I mean, you have all these symbols here. What is this? What does it look like? What were they trying to do in Genesis what? Uh, Genesis 11. What were they trying to do? Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may... You see, I'm going to teach you in a little bit about cities. And there's something wrong with Babel. It is the exact opposite of God's way. God already has a city. 
that we don't have to build, whose builder and maker is God. And it's going to come down for us. Amen? The new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. Mystery Babylon says, let's build us a tower that will reach, that will elevate man into the heavens. And now you know. See, the spiral is all the same there. Okay? Uh, in fact, in Genesis 11, when they were planning out their little conspiracy, they spoke exactly 46 words in your King James Bible. You know what a maypole is? Wait till I tell you what about May 1st, 1776. That's the next thing, okay? Uh, maypole is, is always done on May 1st, and these women dance around a symbol for the male. It's a phallus. Sons of God, daughters of men, and what are they making? Here's the apprentice pillar in Rosalind Chapel, the Rose Line Chapel. It's the lineage of the Antichrist in uh, Scotland, built by the Masons, and uh, built by the Knights Templar. It looks exactly like DNA. The, I actually read up on this. The guy, 500 years ago, the guy that carved out this pillar said he received the idea in a vision, in a dream. Okay? What's the winding staircase of Freemasonry? It's DNA, because it's the path to illumination. Okay? So here you have, on this globe, Jachin, you have the symbol for the earth. On this globe, you have Boaz, the symbol for the heavens, and they are fused together where? In the DNA. Here's the symbol of the male, the cross, the symbol of the female, the crown. It's kind of vulgar. This is a church in our town. You know what they're saying? You're welcome here if you're a Mason. Charles Taze Russell has this exact same emblem on his tombstone, on his pyramid tombstone. Charles Taze Russell started the Jehovah's Witness. See the up and the down? Da Vinci Code. Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. That's what was encoded in Da Vinci's painting. Jesus being a picture of the Antichrist or the sons of God, Mary Magdalene being a picture of the daughters of men and they're fused together. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci drew a sketch. I won't show you all of it, can't show you all of it, but he has a female part and a male part here. It is called Angel in the Flesh. The angel fused in the flesh. This sketch was the basis for da Vinci's John the Baptist. He's making the as above, so below sign. Here's Jesus. This is on a church in Scotland. And here is Mary Magdalene. And look. She's pregnant. That's an abomination. Here's Mary Magdalene, and here's a skull. Guess, remember who we said that was? It's the Antichrist. It's the beast, the place of the skull. Here's the, son, the daughters of men and the sons of God. The Knights Templar, their symbol was the X chromosome or the cross. Here is that X chromosome in the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C., Albert Pike talks about in Morals and Dogma, he calls this the cross. See this one? It's the symbol for life, they call it. Here's, here's a Masonic um, heraldry from, eight, from 1515. See the images? It's a swastika. These are, this is the, um, in the uh, walls of the Masonic House of the Lodge Temple. See the swastikas here? This is an ancient temple floor. Swastikas, light and dark, um, yin and yang. See the DNA? What is this? X chromosome. Who is this? It's the Antichrist. They're mingled together. Guess what this means? I'm going to show you. Manley Hall says the pentagram is the figure for the microcosm the magical formula of man. It is the one rising out of the four. Okay? How many base pairs make up your DNA? And Manley Hall says the pentagram represents the one that is added to those four. Okay? Uh, just like that. This is a, a picture of a pentagram. It's the number five. Okay? Uh, let's talk about triple helix just for a minute. And then we'll, we'll close. 
Um, when they, when they, are, they are going to change man's DNA, man has two-strand DNA right now. Here is an article from Scientific American called Triple Helix, designing a new molecule of what? Life. The idea is to fix man's broken, busted up two-strand DNA so to make man better, cure all man's diseases, okay? This is a symbol for three-strand DNA. What was the symbol on the New King James Bible? You know what they're doing here? See the trichetra? Three-strand DNA. They have their three feet here, that's below. They have their three hands here, that's above. And so they have their three hands joined together here, what does that make? Isis, Horus, or no, excuse me, Osiris, and Horus. And it's here that they pronounce the secret three-syllable name of God. One, two, three. Thus we Masons have three degrees, three great lights, three lesser lights, three principal officers, three assistant officers, three sets of three working tools, three steps, three pillars, three ornaments, on and on and on. Three searching lodges, three who rule a lodge, three grandmasters and three orders of architecture. They're telling you the number three is important. In fact, the respect paid by Freemasons to this number goes far to suggest that our mysteries have affinities not only with the Egyptian rites and ceremonies, That'll keep you from being a Christian and a Mason in itself. God called us out of... In the mythologies of Greece and Rome, the thunderbolt of Jupiter was three-forked. The scepter of Neptune was a trident. In Hindu mythology, the worshiper of Vishnu has his forehead decorated with a trident. The triple tau, three-strand DNA. Um, let's see here. You know how Masons sign their name? See the dots? How they use initials? Triangles, three-strand DNA. See that? Symbolism. Let's, let's see here. What is this from? The movie, I told you I watched National Treasure. The secret that Freemasons brought to this country was hidden under here. Get it? And where did they find the treasure, national treasure? Was it up in the attic? It was in a pit, wasn't it? And they had to go through three doors to find it. Now, I was showing this at lunch. This is the, all, this is the unfinished pyramid in the all-seeing eye. I know what queptus, he favors the birth. That's an interesting term, birth. Because the beast is going to rise up where? Out of the what? Revelation 13. Did you know that seawater and uterine water are the same salinity factor? They're the same. There's, that's seawater in a woman's womb. And who made it that way? He's being birthed, isn't he? So the New World Order has to do with the Antichrist. So here is the unfinished pyramid, and I picked this up from Dan Brown's A Lost Symbol. He didn't say it, but he said enough about it to where I knew what he was talking about. The unfinished pyramid is the unfinished work of humanity, our two-strand DNA. And it's incomplete according to them. Something must be added to it to make man perfect. Three-strand DNA. There are three major companies who have point-of-sale systems at your store where you swipe your card. One is called Ingenico, and their symbol is three-strand DNA. The other is called National Cash Register. Look at their symbol, three-strand DNA. And the other one is Verifone, three-strand DNA. Why? So that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast. Three things, the mark or the name of the beast, for the number of his name. Have you learned something today? Can a Mason be a Christian? If a man is a Mason and he really wants to serve the Lord Jesus Christ at some point in his life, he's got to come out and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Do you believe the Bible today? Say amen.